Welcome back to our special coverage of the Iowa Republican caucuses. The big news of the night, of course, is the news you've probably already heard. Very early on after the caucuses opened, NBC News projected that the winner tonight of the Iowa caucuses will be former President Donald Trump. Now, that was very much expected by polling heading into tonight. Uh, the question for Trump camp Trump's campaign essentially is whether or not he will end up at 50 percent or above, which would be a historic proportion of the vote, whether he will, as it appears he will, um, have a margin over his closest competitor that breaks or potentially even doubles, maybe triples the record of every previous winning margin by any Republican presidential caucus winner in Iowa. Those are the sort of very happy questions that the Trump campaign is mulling tonight. The more tense questions are further down um, among the remaining candidates, specifically Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, as to which of them will get second place, what the margin will be between the two of them, and how badly each of them will be shellacked by Donald Trump. Um, in terms of the structure of their campaigns, the funding of the campaigns, the expectations for their campaigns, and the kinds of voters they've been appealing to with the kinds of messages they've been advancing, um, Nikki Haley's looking to a much easier go of it in New Hampshire, which is the next contest next week, uh, than Ron DeSantis is. That said, if Nikki Haley can't compete with evangelical voters, the next race, race after New Hampshire is in her home state of South Carolina, where even though she's the former governor of South Carolina, she's got a very pro-Trump, very strongly evangelical electorate to contend with there. And then, as my colleague Jen Psaki was just pointing out moments ago, the races thereafter following South Carolina are, again, electorates that are somewhat similar to that, which have been challenging to her. So both Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley have tough slogs ahead of them. Um, the question is whether or not either of them is going to be able to claim any sort of momentum tonight um, with a second place finish or some sort of stronger than expected finish that might cause donors or indeed voters to give them a second look. Now, Chris Hayes, one of the things that you were just talking about was the issue of abortion and how that is motivating uh, voters tonight in Iowa. We have a little bit of information on that, I believe, from the entrance polls. Yeah, Steve, I was just curious. I think there is a, 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 a question about a national abortion ban. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure <laughs> we have half of it I can show you. So we asked folks in this entrance poll, uh, do you favor a federal law banning abortions nationwide? Let me see. Oh, here you go. Here is how those favoring it broke down. And you can see uh, Donald Trump getting just over half, 53%. Ron DeSantis made it a big part of his campaign, 27%. Nikki Haley uh, just at 11 Ramaswamy at 9 um, I don't believe we have the second part of this poll working, unfortunately. I'm going to try one more time. But the, the point of this is that Nikki Haley is doing much better with this right. group than she is with that group. Although she has been insisting on the campaign trail, you know, call her pro-life. She said she's opposed to abortion as anybody else is. Um, but there, that's the divide you're seeing here. And, and again, I'm sorry, that's, that's just... Not no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that for a few reasons. One is term, in terms of taking the temperature of the sort of uh, views of this segment of the electorate, which is sort of the most. And that's not that surprising, although it's actually pretty interesting that 36% oppose amongst this crowd, right? right? I mean, I, I, th I think probably before Dobbs, that number would be lower, mm -hmm. right? Before the, before the sort of Dobbs overturning of Roe, I think that, that there's some people who have had some second thoughts about that. I also think it shows, and this is one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind throughout the rest of this, that abortion politics have not proven to be much of a wedge or very sticky in the primary. Again, mm -hmm. this keeps being a theme. What's coming up in the primary? What people? But it's going to be a big one in the national right. election, and there's going to be there's huge support among uh, the institutions of the Republican Party, the conservative movement, the evangelicals that are giving Donald Trump their support for a national abortion ban. And there's going to be a big push for that. There's going to be a lot of dissembling about from, from the Republican nominee, whoever it is, about whether they intend that. But keep that number in mind. Okay, but then that's the question for Jen. How does the no. Biden <laughs> White House mm -hmm. look at tonight? Right? Mm -hmm. So you have an overwhelming amount uh, of evangelicals in a white state, mm -hmm. a white influential state, back Donald Trump, who delivered them a Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And on the other side, when we get to a general election, there are millions of Americans who are not enthused about politics or not even necessarily enthused about Joe Biden, mm -hmm. who have shown that they come out in droves to vote for the exact opposite of the one issue that motivates evangelical voters. Well, look, I think they're looking at this and they're going to 
to continue to shove Donald Trump's three judges on the Supreme Court down his throat because they've made a decision, and we've seen this in how the president has talked and in some of the advertising they've done that D Joe Biden running as the person who's going to protect abortion rights against Donald Trump, who said, sort of to his credit, because it's a recognition of reality, that his, the politics of the Republican Party is bad on abortion rights, true statement by Donald Trump, but they will paint him as for the abortion ban. That is exactly what they will do. I think if they're sitting here watching all of this, it's a little counterintuitive because normally if you're on the other side, especially an incumbent, you want the primary to go on as long as possible so they can fight each other out and kind of spend a lot of money. And Joe Biden is actually being helped a little bit by this because in New Hampshire, where people thought, many people, myself included, that Joe Biden would lose support in New Hampshire because he wasn't on the ballot, he's actually doing better there because he's benefiting from all the attacks on Donald Trump. But overall, they want this to be a clear race between Biden and Trump for the electorate. And there's a surprising number, I think you mentioned this earlier, Chris, of people who don't think that is what the race is going to be. Yeah. And until it's crystallized, it's hard for them to run the race against Donald Trump. In, in fact, there was polling that showed a lot of people, uh, I think it was even a majority, didn't think that he would be the nominee. And right. in that respect, there is a little bit of a kind of jujitsu moment here for them, which is Donald Trump is obviously, he likes to win stuff, so he's going to be very, very excited to go out and be like, I won, and look how big I won, and he's going to read off all his poll numbers in all the counties he won, right? But it also is, I can be a crystallizing moment for the Biden campaign to say, like, it is good. He is going to be the nominee. Like, it is this guy, the guy that, like, got kicked off social media, and you're not reading him on Truth Social, and you're not seeing the utterly insane and vile things he's saying every day, and he's receded to the background a little bit in your mind, and you've got some gauzy recollections of him because you don't want to think about him. Like, it is going to be him, that guy, the one, the one that you don't want to think about, it is going to be that guy. And they are doing that. It's just not working yet, right? Yeah. I mean, they don't utter the name Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis. It doesn't come out of the right. mouths of anybody who works there, typically. They are trying to run against Trump, but people still don't think he's going to be the nominee. Is it because they think he's going to be convicted? Their view is it's actually people just aren't tuned in. No, I think they're not paying yet. I, Can I ask you a question? Because the, 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 I am struck by, to, to sound a little bit like Lawrence for a moment, it is still 48 to 49 percent of the electorate in a heavily white evangelical state said not Trump, yeah. said yeah. something other than Trump is what we want. I mean, sure, he's going to brag about getting 52 percent, but 52 percent ain't 100 percent, it ain't 80 percent, no. right? He is a, incumbent, a former president who's sort of playing the role of an incumbent who's at 52, which means that there is room for something else. Now, the something else's are the other guy who passed a six-week abortion ban, Ron DeSantis and the guy who sued Disney, or Nikki Haley, who says she's also willing to sign a national abortion ban. So there's only slight degrees of difference between between the other the alternatives but how does the white house look at the fact that there is apparently an opening even in a state like Iowa for something other than Trump. I don't think they think there's an opening in Iowa, just to be clear. Right. I mean, I mean in that there's state. like 100,000 more registered Republicans there now than there were in 2016. And they're just, I don't think they're going to invest resources there. Sure. But it isn't a very interesting question to watch moving forward, right? Especially if it becomes a longer prim Republican primary race. Does Trump, I mean, 49% is not great for him, actually, in an in electorate in a right. lot of these future states. Does that happen? We don't know yet. But for the Biden team, once you start to get to states that are actual swing states, it will become a really interesting question. This point about the Biden campaign and how Democrats are feeling about these results and how the general election is shaping up, we actually have somebody to talk to who may know something about this from the inside. Um, the National Democratic Party, of course, last year decided to drop the Iowa caucuses as the first in the nation contest for the Democrats' presidential nomination, ending 50 years of the Iowa caucuses being first for the Democrats. Uh, in Iowa this year, Democrats will choose their nominee in a primary that's going to be conducted by mail-in ballot. The results will be released on March 5th on Super Tuesday. That means the Democrats are not contesting the, 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 the Democratic presidential nomination in Iowa tonight, but Democrats are not really contesting the Democratic presidential nomination this year in any significant way. And that means that Democrats right now are essentially very interest, interested spectators watching what's on happening with Donald Trump and the rest of the Republican field in Iowa and ahead in the next states that are going to decide this nomination. Joining us now from Des Moines is J.B. Pritzker. He's the 
governor of Illinois. He's an advisor to the Biden-Harris campaign, and he's in the catbird seat tonight for the Biden-Harris campaign, watching what's happening in Iowa. Governor, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Great to be with you, Rachel. So we had a quick call tonight, a quick projection from our network and indeed from other networks that Donald Trump was going to be the winner. Looks like he is going to be the overwhelming winner tonight in the Iowa Republican caucuses. Uh, from your perch as an advisor to the Biden-Harris campaign and as a Democratic governor in Illinois, what's your reaction to that news? Well, I think Joy had it right. Almost half of the base of the Republican Party showing up for this caucus tonight voted against Donald Trump. Think about that. I mean, this is the most famous Republican. He's the guy who, you know, basically built the modern Republican Party, the MAGA Republican Party that Democrats are running against. And half the people in that party didn't vote for Donald Trump. So I think that is telling. It tells you the weakness of Donald Trump and also the opportunity for Democrats. Because in the end, look, uh, if the base doesn't turn out for Donald Trump in the general election enthusiastically and Democrats turn out its base, this is all about, you know, independents and independents don't like Donald Trump. So I think we're in a pretty good uh, place tonight to, to, to see what's happening on the Republican side. Uh, if Donald Trump, in fact, is the uh, uh, winner tonight and able to win in New Hampshire and in South Carolina, probably the race is over. But the truth is that all of these candidates are running as sort of mini-me Trump Republicans. Uh, they all have exactly the position that you mentioned earlier, six-month, uh, six-week ban on abortion. Uh, they want a national abortion ban. The Republican Party is standing against working families. And Donald Trump is representative of, I think, everything that is wrong with the uh, current environment in politics. Governor, we're used to, uh, in the news business and as political observers, we're used now to um, Donald Trump saying that the 2020 election was stolen and that uh, he really was reelected by a gigantic margin and there's this sort of parallel universe in which he's secretly still president or something. Uh, we're used to hearing those claims um, from former President Trump and a lot of that led into um, the, the efforts to overturn the 2020 election, which has become a criminal matter in federal court and in state court in the state of Georgia. We're, we're used to watching that and seeing it with him. But tonight we're seeing entrance poll results out of Iowa showing that two-thirds of Iowa Republican caucus goers tonight do not believe that Joe Biden was legitimately elected president um, in 2020. It's not just Trump. Um, that's two-thirds is a larger number than, than Donald Trump will, will win tonight among Iowa Republican caucus goers. What do you make of that poll finding? And, and what does the Biden-Harris campaign have to do to contend with that, that fantasy among Republican voters at large? Well, there's no doubt the Republican Party, especially Donald Trump, have been pushing out falsehoods for years now. I do think that Republicans, many of them, especially the base of the base, and that's really who shows up at a caucus, right, that they believe the craziness that, in fact, Joe Biden, that, that he wasn't elected in 2020. Uh, and Donald Trump feeds into that falsehood. He does it every time on virtually every issue. And I do think that it's going to be incumbent upon us, on Democrats, on Joe Biden, to make sure we're telling the truth, that we're making sure people understand what's really going on in this race and what each candidate truly stands for. Once again, someone in your, I think your whole panel actually, believes that abortion is going to be a major major issue in this campaign. I think that's one it's going to be very hard for them to prevaricate about. Uh, the truth is that it's been Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that are standing up for a woman's right to choose, for reproductive rights in general, for protecting people's freedoms. And I think that will come through in the general election once the Republicans have settled in on their nominee. Governor Pritzker, it's Alex Wagner. Um, to the degree that the Biden campaign understands this is going to be a very close general election in November, how worried is the campaign about third-party candidates? There's been some marginal support for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Cornell West, Jill Stein. We're going to see a test of that in South Carolina, which was very good to President Biden in 2020, but where it, there has been some increasingly sort of distance between him and black voters in the state. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the Biden campaign sees the third-party challenges. 
Well, those of us who are old enough to remember the Bush-Gore race in, uh, in uh, 2000, you know, we know that third-party candidates can really make a difference in a negative way. Uh, but the truth is, if you look at, for example, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s numbers, he's roughly pulling half and half from each side. Uh, I don't think that he'll have a big effect, maybe one or two percent with the other candidates. But again, we haven't even run the race yet. If you look at what's happening, people are just now beginning to pay some attention, but they don't know who the Republican nominee is going to be, even though we're all saying that Donald Trump is running ahead. Uh, so I don't think that they've had a chance yet to truly uh, measure uh, what it will mean, the two visions, one against another. And so I think once Joe Biden is out there, actually running against Donald Trump directly, uh, we're going to see a, a significant lead develop for the president. Governor Pritzker, there's been um, inter-democratic consternation reporting, uh, which I know is the most frustrating thing for a campaign to hear about and to have reported on and have to respond to. Um, but I ask you to respond to it. Is there um, reason to worry? Is there, have you had any consternation or worry about whether or not um, the Biden campaign is being nimble enough, aggressive enough, acting early enough? Are they well-funded enough, well-organized enough uh, to stand up against what looks like a, an early de facto nomination by the, Dem by the, by the Republican Party um, and uh, a, a Trump campaign that seems to be, if nothing else, more professional? They had a better ground game in Iowa than they did uh, when they had to run there the last time around. What do you make about the strength um, of the of the Harris Biden campaign, of the Biden Harris campaign right now, um, and how they're responding to some of that internal Democratic criticism? Well, they're building the infrastructure for delivering in November, and so I don't think you've uh, you know seen what they can do. What I know is that, yeah, there was some bedwetting for sure in the fall uh, when people started to see some polls that they didn't like or just overall concern. I think the reality is things are much better now. There's a real confidence that's developing uh, among supporters. And it's partly because new polling data in the swing states, partly because the significant haul of resources that's been brought into the Biden-Harris campaign. So a lot of faith shown there. And partly because the economic numbers are getting better. People are earning more money. Inflation has gone down. The price of gas has gone down. Uh, mortgage rates are coming down. And that's all inuring to the benefit of Democrats and Joe Biden. So over the next four, five, six months, I think as you see things improving uh, economically and people starting to really feel it because it will have been almost a full year in which things are getting better, uh, I believe you're going to start to see some real confidence developed all across the country and Democrats in every state. Uh, hi, Governor. Uh, this is Joy Reid. Uh, I have a question. Is it bedwetting, though? Because I think that there is some significant anecdotal evidence that President Biden does have some issues in terms of uh, parts of the younger electorate that are not in a good place with him on things like Gaza, on the you know bombing of Yemen. There were just protests outside of the White House this past week. There is some energy that's building, particularly among Arab American voters, Muslim American voters who say they will not vote for him um, because of his stance on Gaza. Is that is it bedwetting or is the White House maybe not paying enough attention to real passionate objections to its policies by younger voters that they need? to turn out, and I mean younger voters, including younger African-American voters. Well, when you're a responsible leader, when you're in office, you have to make tough decisions, no doubt about it. And every time you have to make a tough decision, someone doesn't like it. Uh, the truth is that uh, we've seen Joe Biden uh, underestimated all along uh, in his entire career, and especially in 2020. Uh, in 2024, I think what we're going to see is a real focus on the things that really matter to people's individual lives, to their families, to their communities. And that's, you know, the economy. It means their freedoms. We've talked about choice. Uh, I, in a lot of places in the country, people are deeply concerned about gun violence. And uh, we know that Joe Biden has stood up 
for a uh, ban on assault weapons, and, and he has stood up for uh, violence prevention programs in a way that Republicans just want to let go and, frankly, let people shoot each other wherever they may be with as many guns as they may want to have. So I, I do think that a focus on the issues that really matter to working families across the United States is going to matter for Joe Biden in a positive way. Now, there are always detractors, right? There are people that even that vote for Donald Trump who don't like things about Donald Trump. But in the end, when people are going to see the two visions for the future of America, that young people and people of color across the United States, not to mention the vast majority of American workers, know that it's Joe Biden that's fighting for them and Joe Biden that'll do better for them. Donald Trump will be a disaster for those groups. And you don't think that the White House needs to adjust or that the Biden reelection campaign needs to adjust in any way its messaging on issues of war and peace? Because these are issues, I mean, we are on MLK Day, and we do know that one of the things that Dr. King did later in his life was to oppose the Vietnam War. And this was an important issue to him, as important in the end of his life as fighting for living wages and for racial justice. You know, issues of war and peace are passion issues. They're voting voting issues. And for a lot of younger Americans, not even just younger Americans, but a lot of progressives and a lot of just people who have a humanist view of the world, the Gaza issue is a voting issue. So you're saying that people will ignore that? You don't think that the White House needs to in any way adjust its messaging on that? Well, look, here's what the White House has been doing. They're fighting, you know, what has become a mortal enemy of the United States, and that's Vladimir Putin. Uh, they're, they're standing up for democracy in Ukraine. Uh, they're fighting against terrorism in the Middle East. Those are the things that I think the messages that the Biden administration needs to make sure they're getting out to people. But look, nobody likes war. I mean, I, they, we'd like to have all of this ratcheted down and go away. And I know the president wants that, right? But it, you have to have a careful uh, foreign policy expert in the White House who understands how to manage all that in a very difficult environment. You think Donald Trump has shown that he can do that? Do you think Donald Trump would handle this better than Joe Biden? The answer clearly is no. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, advisor to the Biden-Harris campaign. We really appreciate your time tonight, sir, joining us from Des Moines. Thanks very much. Thank right, you, gonna... Rachel. We're going to take a, a quick break. As we go to break, though, take a look at these latest numbers. We've now got 38% of the vote in statewide in Iowa. Again, big news tonight is that the projected winner is Donald Trump. Right now, he stands above 52% of the vote, which is a historic margin. The big contest, the tight race here, is for second place between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. Again, with just 38% of the vote in, DeSantis just barely ahead of Haley. But look at the, the raw vote there in terms of the total number of votes that we're talking about here. Here. Still a lot more to learn tonight about how this is going to go. Stay with us. of the Iowa caucuses, the Republican Iowa caucuses, where NBC News has projected that Donald Trump will be the winner at the end of the night. Right now, he stands at 52.6 percent, which, of course, would be a historic margin. Fighting it out for second place are Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, who are quite close to one another. Let's bring in former Obama campaign manager David Pluff and Jennifer Palmieri, former White House uh, communications director and senior advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Jen is now co-host of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win in 2024. David and Jen, we're really happy to have both of you here. We're going to ask you to do something slightly weird, which is that we would like to hear advice from both of you for Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, battling it out for second place tonight in Iowa, looking ahead at a bleak but potentially feasible future what should each of those campaigns be looking to do after Iowa? Starting with me or David? Jen, let's start with you. Okay, great, thanks. So I think that, um, you know, I think Haley has the most on the line here because she's the one that has a potential future. David and I have been together all night. We've been talking about this all night. Um, DeSantis doesn't really have a lot to go. And so I think it, you know, she is in a tough fight right now for second place. She should get out very soon 
to a public event in Iowa right now and say, amazing night, Iowa. We came from behind. We did so well. It's so great. And then get herself on a plane to New Hampshire and be poised to make the most of that momentum. And and when and you know you you need that footage. You need that footage tonight of her being enthusiastic with a lot of supporters. We need you know seeing that footage first. Even if she doesn't say I came in second, it kind of marks you as the winter. It like it gets cemented in people's brains. And then she needs to figure out how between uh, Monday night and Wednesday morning she has built on that momentum and has like a really great runway in New Hampshire. Because if you don't figure out in the first 36 hours after Iowa how you make it seem like you have a lot of momentum in New Hampshire, you're going to die there. Wow. David Pluff, any thoughts for either Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis in terms of how they, how they move ahead after what will be either a distant second place finish or a distant third place finish? Well, Rachel, we can always be surprised in politics, but I think DeSantis' road ends tonight. I mean, this mm. was his only hope, uh, mm. and he's going to end up being beat by 30 points. And if you look down, he's got nothing going on in New Hampshire. Hard to believe he could do any better than a poor third in South Carolina. So he may stay in. He's kind of a ghost roaming the, the country. I think for Haley, I agree with Jen. She has to win New Hampshire, or her path is over. If she wins New Hampshire, uh, then they need to think through. They're probably going to lose her home state of South Carolina, which will not be a lot of fun to Donald Trump. But then you get into Super Tuesday, and there's going to be some states where Trump's going to be a huge favorite, but there's also going to be states where Haley potentially could get to 50 percent. So the, the, I agree with Jen tactically. She needs to get to New Hampshire ASAP and, and close really well over these last eight days. She also has to refresh her message a little bit. I mean, I think I would say, listen, Donald Trump won. Congratulations to the former president. But half the voters in, our, in a very conservative state like Iowa won a different nominee. Why is that? Because this is the guy that lost to Joe Biden, feeble, meek, horrible Joe Biden. And you think he's going to be able to beat him again? So I think she needs to tap into that um, and go for broke here because her candidacy basically uh, either is on, you know, small but at least existing path to somehow be the nominee uh, or it's going to be over. So I think that's where we are. My guess is DeSantis will stay in and say I came in second and I'm going to stay in and I can be the alternative. I just don't see that there's any opening because at the end of the day this comes down to the acquisition of votes and you have to have a theory of how you're going to eventually get over 50 percent of the vote against Donald Trump. And I think DeSantis's plan was to win tonight. I look back to us in 08, Barack Obama, had we lost Iowa, he would have been just a mere footnote in American political history of that. We put all of our chips on that, as did DeSantis. So when that doesn't work out, you know, you bust. But mm -hmm. for Haley, it's to win New Hampshire and then figure out what's my Super Tuesday strategy so that I can withstand a likely loss in my home state of South Carolina to Donald Trump. David, it's Chris Hayes. Let me, can I ask you another question? And then, Jen, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this, too. Uh, again, I don't want to be overly premature here, but you said in your, to your mind that DeSantis is effectively a, now a walking ghost after tonight's performance. If there's one th thing that he did wrong, I mean, there was a period, as Steve pointed out, when he was polling head to head or even up, there was a ton of money, a ton of enthusiasm, particularly after the midterms when the Republican Party disappointed across the nation, where Trump backed candidates did particularly poorly and DeSantis did very well, cruising to reelection. How did it, what, what did they screw up? Well, uh, you know, Chris, to become the nominee of a party, you actually have to be a decent candidate. So mm. what they screwed up was That's he was awesome. a terrible candidate. So, I mean, what we've learned historically <laughs> is that you know, and he's the governor of Florida. You think that's a big stage. I mean, the, the political graveyard is littered with people who look like on paper they'd be strong presidential candidates. Yep. But having gone through this, I mean, this is basically like a searing proctological exam being been to every home. And very few people come out whole on the other side. Mm. And he was diminished Colorful. by this. Uh, and so I think at the end of the day, yes, he started off strong. Clearly, Trump's indictments helped him. But DeSantis never could basically occupy that stage. Yeah. Uh, and he was just not a strong performer. And at the end of the day, Haley, if she wins New Hampshire, which is a big if, but if she does, uh, Trump and the media, she's going to be under a, a really, really brutal spotlight. Uh, and that will be her test. But I think that's it. I think strategically, Chris, I think it was the right decision to go all in in Iowa. I don't think there was another strategy no, out there. So, you know, and, and historically, that's worked for a few candidates. It hasn't worked for most.
Jen, can I ask you the timing question? So I agree with, 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 with David Wright. Like, ultimately, you have to be a good candidate. And if you're not a good candidate, this is what you get. And I, he's, he was not a good candidate. Maybe in some other iteration he is. Yeah. But there was the question of, like, striking while the iron's hot, right? right? There's just been these three moments in Trump's political life since, you know, 2015. There was after the Access Hollywood tape. Yep. There was, like, looked like he was right teetering headed right. for the excerpts. There is after January 6th. When he's at an adir, and there's right after the midterms, there's right. that basically month, and at no point did anyone do the thing necessary in the moment to kind of end his political career. And here's what you could have done in Iowa. You know, Ron DeSantis could have gone there and say, "Look, Iowa in 2016, you had questions about Donald Trump. You didn't select him." And you know what? Maybe in the end he was the right person for 2016, but you were right to have questions. This job of this state is to ferret out who the best person to lead this country is, and you all are going to do that this time. We're going to do that together. We're going to figure that out together. But, like, you have always known that the, he was not the right that he was not the right leader. And if you could have built, but you would it would take the courage of conviction to say, hey, to understand, 40% of the party doesn't support Donald Trump, right? Even right. today, the polling shows that 60% do, 40% don't. And I, I do think, you know, there's a chance that Trump is still vulnerable here because 50% of Iowans aren't going to vote for him. 40% of the country, Republicans in the country, don't support him. It is built on a house of cards, and it is built, his strategy is built on lies. And, you know, if, if Nikki Haley is willing to speak really frankly in the next eight days in New Hampshire, and she wins there, and she doesn't get scared but feels empowered and then continues to make that argument that, you know, call him out on his lies, and this is, and Republicans are reacting to that, Trump may still end up as the nominee, but he's going to get, you know, he's going to be a weaker nominee. It's going to, you know, for Republicans, I just think it's so valuable when Republicans call him out on lies. That makes a big difference. But Jennifer, Chris, I was just going to jump into so Jennifer real quick. Uh, Ari here, I'm... Comment and a question. Comment is it almost sounds like you're suggesting that the Haley campaign should buy another website. Trump lies and do that in addition to DeSantis lies. And I don't know what their URL, you know, purchasing yeah. capacity well, Maybe act like he's the front runner <laughs> like instead he's of the DeSantis. Front runner. And that goes to the question, which is both of you who have experience are saying to do this effectively, you have to make a strong, broad case against the former president and apparent front runner, who, of course, tonight won Iowa. And that seems also straightforward because in 16, a relatively unpopular candidate, you referred to how DeSantis looked, uh, not on paper, but in reality, Ted Cruz was not always most beloved by Republicans, independents, Democrats, or humans. Uh, but Ted Cruz powered his way to stopping Donald Trump's momentum, won over 10 states, and was very harshly critical. Uh, I'm curious why that sort of precedent or, or lesson, Jennifer, uh, hasn't resonated more, or do you think it's more complex than that because now that he's the former president, there is a dance to be done with the soft supporters. I think that you can't you can't get over 50 without some Trump supporters, right? Mm, That's just right, right. right. So I think people, I, I, I don't think these people are stupid. Ron DeSantis' team is not stupid. Nick Haley's team is not stupid. They're smart people running their teams. And but I think they're banking on, you know, they're banking on Trump collapsing in some ways because of the because of convictions or something else. And but both Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, more so DeSantis, I think, than her, have fed into the notion that if the convictions do happen, they're not going to be legitimate because they don't accept the indictments as legitimate. Right. And so it's just they're just in this circular, you know, uh, ecosystem where they can't bust out, you know, they're not willing to bust out of it to try to really take him on. The one person who did, of course, Chris Christie, you know, comes in here, comes out of this race, you know, with probably more respect in the country, but lower approval ratings in the Republican Party than he's ever had. Jen Palmieri, uh, senior advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, David Pluff, campaign manager uh, to former President Obama. Really good, really good to have you both here. We will forward all your advice yeah. to the Haley and <laughs> DeSantis campaigns. I'm sure they will definitely take it. Uh, we're going to take a quick break right now. We're going to come back and put some numbers and some of the things that we have been talking about, namely what's happening in terms of the race for second place. We have just had a big new chunk of vote come in. We're over 50 
percent of the vote in uh, in in Iowa right now. We'll talk about what that means in terms of that tight race between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. We'll also talk about that next step, that path, and what it looks like in New Hampshire. Both of our campaign experts there talking about how it may be a necessity for Nikki Haley to win or get close to winning in New Hampshire. Is that possible? Is that possible? We'll talk about it when we come back. Stay with us. There has been a projection this evening for the winner of the Iowa Republican caucuses. The question of who's got second is a matter of ongoing observation, speculation, and worry for the two campaigns. Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley battling it out. Steve Kornacki over at the big board for us. We've now got more than 60% of the vote in statewide. Are we getting close to a clear picture of who's going to get second? Um, you, you see DeSantis now is almost two full points here and about 1,400 votes ahead of Nikki Haley. Um, our decision desk gives the actual characterization on one leading or the other, and they haven't done that yet. But I can show you a couple of the counties where we've gotten a little bit more clarity here. Let's start in Dallas County. Almost all the vote is in now. Again, big big suburban county right outside Des Moines here. This was, we say Haley has that very similar coalition to Marco Rubio from eight years ago. Marco Rubio won this county eight years ago. You can see the result right here. Nikki Haley, I think a bit of a disappointment to her. Uh, you know, not only that she's not a little bit closer to Trump here, these are counties I think ideally she would have liked to have a shot to win, but also the margin she's getting over Ron DeSantis here. This becomes very important to her in terms of that question. If you're, if you're trying to get second place, this this demographically is a county where she should be able to get second place over DeSantis, and she is, but the margin there you can see is 88 votes at the moment, and there aren't too many votes left. She probably wanted a bigger pad than that. From a, This is a very big county in terms of population here, and certainly in terms of her demographic strengths. We've got more than two-thirds now in, in the biggest county in the state. And again, this is a Marco Rubio County from 2016. Uh, this is Polk County where Des Moines is, the city itself, but also a lot of suburban areas in this county. And again, more vote to come in, but Haley's not even running in second here. It's close. You know, it's a difference of 22 votes, but again, this is a county where she wants some pad over DeSantis. And, you know, and meanwhile, if you just start looking through, well, she, actually, we have it. Worth County was a bad one to pick there. <laughs> Trump's up and Haley is tied with DeSantis there, but you see a lot of these other, you know, smaller counties here. This is a, a good example here. Haley's not even registering. This was Ted Cruz. Well, this is a small number of votes, but this was Ted Cruz's best county in 2016. And we are seeing a lot of these rural areas here where DeSantis is outpacing Haley. Also getting a little bit more clarity in the northwest part of the state, which we've spent a lot of the night talking about. We've been stuck on some low vote totals in some of these key counties. We've got a lot now in, in Sioux County. Remember, DeSantis had actually taken a lead here. Trump has now got the lead in Sioux County with nearly 60% of the vote in the significance. Deeply, deeply evangelical. Trump's worst county in all of Iowa in 2016. At this point, this is a gain of about 40 points for him relative to his 2016 showing. We're still sitting at the same number here in Lyon County, demographically a very similar county to Sioux County. So you add it all together, it's certainly a race here for second place. Now you can see it's, it's uh, 1,332 votes separating uh, DeSantis and Haley. It's certainly a race for second place. We got a little bit more in there that favored DeSantis. But DeSantis, you know, has now consistently been running about a point, point and a half, two points points ahead of Haley. And, and you see, I think, in the, that Des Moines area in particular, Haley probably would have liked to have done a little bit better there. Steve, in the real politic of this, as you have, I think, rightfully pointed out, the distance between the first place projected winner and the people who are fighting it out for second place is vast. Yeah. And so in terms of what this means going ahead, eh, you know, I mean, really, it's, a, it's an overwhelming win by Donald Trump. That said, if Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are looking at the existential questions of their, for their campaigns and whether or not there is a reason for them to carry on, the next question is going to be New Hampshire. And I know we obviously don't have any results from New Hampshire. New Hampshire hasn't happened yet. But when you look at the polls in New Hampshire, does Nikki Haley actually have a chance of winning there, of, of not just competing for second, but potentially competing for first? Yes. Um, it's the state Donald Trump is in the most danger of losing. And I'm going to make a really dated reference here, but we talked about it earlier if you were watching, and I think it's relevant to this discussion of what comes next. I said that the dynamics of this Republican race in Iowa most closely resembled the George W. Bush, John McCain race from back in 2000. And it starts here in Iowa because in 2000, if you remember, 
John McCain only did a half-hearted effort in Iowa. He Try. He spent some time in the state, uh, but he was really camped out in New Hampshire. And as he was running far behind George W. Bush in Iowa with no expectation of beating him, he was spending money and time in New Hampshire and polling even before Iowa close to Bush in New Hampshire. Meanwhile, in Iowa, the DeSantis of 2000 was Steve Forbes. He camped out in the state. He made you know a do or die effort in Iowa. He got second place to Bush, and his campaign was done. So it was Bush coming out winning Iowa, and then it was a candidate who was polling strongly in New Hampshire, who wasn't much of a factor in Iowa, John McCain, who went to New Hampshire. And John McCain upset, famously, by a crushing margin, George W. Bush in New Hampshire. And if you take a look, this is the polling, the average of the polling in New Hampshire right now. Look at that. It's Trump 43. It's Haley 30. Now, why does Haley have a chance to win here like John McCain did? It's the exact same model. John McCain appealed to independent voters in New Hampshire. He won them by a crushing majority over George W. Bush in 2000. Every one of the new polls that's come out in New Hampshire, they don't have Haley ahead of Trump overall yet, but they have Haley winning with independent voters. And we just showed in Iowa how strong she is with independent voters. And the key is that independent voters play a much bigger role in the New Hampshire primary than they do in virtually any other state. But we could fill some of this in right now from what we've learned from Iowa, which is the comparison of the demographics of these three states. Iowa now 54% evangelical tonight, 16% independent, 10% moderate. That's the electorate that has Haley running 30 points behind Donald Trump. This is what the electorate looked like in New Hampshire in 2016. You know, only 25% evangelical, a much more secular Republican electorate. Look at the number of independents who took Republican ballots, 42% of the Republican electorate, 27% moderate. So this, these are the ingredients that these are the perfect ingredients for Nikki Haley here um, compared to Iowa. So that's why she's close in the state. And the wild card is those independents. With no, there is a Democratic primary. There's a write-in effort for Joe Biden. But I, I expect most independents are going to choose to participate in the Republican primary. So that 42% number, remember, there was a big uh, race there in 2016 on the Democratic side. I suspect that 42% number may go up. And the higher it goes up, the better Haley's chances are in New Hampshire. And as you say, that would then go down to South Carolina. That would be her home state. And you see the demographics in South Carolina. Again, they look very different, very evangelical, far fewer independents taking part, less, fewer moderates in the race. And again, if you think back to 2000 and John McCain, what tripped up John McCain? It was he won New Hampshire. And he became a political sensation. It was the story in American politics for three weeks, Bush versus McCain. Could McCain actually pull this off? What stopped McCain was the fact, was the way he won New Hampshire. He won New Hampshire on the strength of, of uh, independent voters. The exit poll showed that Bush actually won registered Republicans. McCain won independents. So they went down to South Carolina, and Bush made it a loyalty test to Republicans. And he said, my opponent is winning the vote, the votes of non-Republicans. He's winning independents. He's winning Democrats. He's winning the votes of people who want to cause mischief in our primary. The media, the liberal media, our enemy, is cheering him on. Are you with them, or are you with me, a good Republican? And South Carolina went for Bush by double digits. And then we, it became a pattern. McCain stayed in it for another week or two, and state after state, where your independents and Democrats Democrats were allowed to vote. McCain won huge among that group. But among Republicans, Bush started winning by 40, 50, 60 points over McCain. And within three weeks, Bush had shut down McCain. Trump, a long way of saying, Trump coming out of a, if Haley wins New Hampshire, Trump is positioned to make the same loyalty argument that George W. Bush made all those years ago. It wouldn't be so much loyalty to the Republican Party as loyalty to Trump. But Trump is extremely well right, liked among Republican voters. And we have seen this time and time again. Who were the least popular Republicans to run this cycle? They were Chris Christie, Mike Pence, and Asa Hutchinson. When you are defined as the candidate of Trump's critics, of Trump's opponents, when you yourself issue criticisms of Donald Trump, Republican voters who like Donald Trump, and that is the vast majority of Republican voters, turn on you. So that's the danger for Nikki Haley. I think she could win New Hampshire. The demographic mix is perfect for her. But if she does so, it would be with independent voters. They would be the ones making the difference. And I think Republican voters, history tells us, would be very suspicious of a candidate like that. And if you get beyond South Carolina, and again, if she loses her home state, that's a tough one to explain. But when you get beyond that, 
the playing field shifts and we start getting to states that aren't officially winner-take-all states in terms of delegates, but they are states that were, where the winner could take all of the delegates or the vast majority. I'll just give you some of the examples. March 5th on Super Tuesday, the biggest state to vote is going to be California, 169 delegates in California. The Republicans at the behest of the Trump campaign changed the rules. They said if you get 50% plus one in California, you get all 169 delegates. New poll today, Cal Berkeley, Donald Trump. Trump in California, 66% of the vote in California. He would sweep all 169 if he got anything approaching that on March 5th. You look at some of the other states, Alabama, 50 delegates. There'd be an opportunity for Donald Trump to sweep all 50 of those delegates. Uh, you've got Tennessee uh, voting that day, 58 delegates. You've got Oklahoma, 43. Trump could take the lion's share in both of those states along with North Carolina, 74. Texas, 161. They have provisions in a lot of these states where if you're winning congressional districts and getting a 50% in a congressional district, you get all the delegates in the congressional district. If you get 50% statewide, you get all the statewide delegates. So the opportunity for Trump on March 5th, if he's putting up numbers and registering support with Republicans, that the way he is tonight and the way he is in these polls, the opportunity is there for him to take a gigantic delegate lead in this race. This, the delegates' rules on the Republican side are not at all like the Democratic side, where you just get 15 percent and you start getting a big chunk of every state's delegates. It's hard to pull away in a Democratic primary. On a Republican primary, it's easy. And by the way, I think what, what Steve is saying is so important, and the, the evangelical piece, you cannot overemphasize it enough. I was just looking, Googling from, from PRI the numbers. Evangelical voters are 14.5% of the United States, but they're, and they're 28% of all voters. But of even white evangelical voters, I should say, 76% of them voted for Donald Trump in 2020. Mainline Protestants tend to split, and then black evangelicals tend to go very heavily for Democrats. The challenge for Nikki Haley is that even if she does well and wins somehow wins a miraculous race in New Hampshire, everywhere else that she has to win is full of white evangelical voters. There's they're no overrepresented. Crossover. With that independent voter in New Hampshire, there's no crossover at all. with that voter and an evangelical voter who just voted in Iowa saying, I'm anti-immigrant and Donald Trump is the chosen one. They're never going to pick Nikki Hitt. I'm not even saying that to be sassy. No, We're no. hearing it not over at all. and over. And where they're overrepresented, North Carolina, Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, and Wisconsin. That's to say nothing of the entire South. The challenge Nikki Haley has is that she could be a one-hit wonder in New Hampshire, and she will get a lot of media attention. But in the end, and we've literally been writing squirreling notes to each other, the problem she's going to have, however much her donors may dream of her being the new George W. Bush and somehow recreating the George W. Bush electorate, the actual electorate, the real electorate in the Republican Party is heavily made up of white evangelical voters for whom it is a religious test that they support Donald Trump. I don't know how she gets past that even if she wins. The we pipe dream. Uh, very interesting about those voters tonight and I don't think we could have learned this without the Dobbs decision because during the Roe versus Wade years uh, the abortion politics were locked in place and so there were many most Republican candidates were running on no exceptions uh, banning all abortions. John McCain, when he ran for president, didn't understand the language of that. So when he was asked uh, the first time he ran for president, um, what about if your daughter was pregnant, would you absolutely forbid an abortion? And he said, well, we'd have a family meeting about that. And he had to reverse himself within 24 hours because the answer had to be absolutely no abortion. It was all theoretical, though, mm -hmm. because abortion was legal throughout the country because of Roe versus Wade. Now we have tonight uh, these voters who are the, as conservative on abortion as they get in the United States of America. They ranked for us the importance of these issues mm. in, in, the, in their voting. Uh, abortion, 12 percent, mm. tied with foreign policy. <laughs> Immigration is triple yeah. that. Right, yeah. um, and then what they did with their vote was vote for the guy who in Republican terms is very weak on abortion. Mike Pence thought that he had Donald Trump cornered when Donald Trump opposed DeSantis's six-week ban in Florida. DeSantis thought he had him cornered too. Trump said to these voters who accept it, 
A lot of people don't know. Most people don't know they're pregnant uh, within six weeks. Trump says that's no good. And then what is Trump's position? He says, I will negotiate a period of time that everyone will agree on. Well, the Supreme Court <laughs> negotiated a period of time called Roe versus Wade. Uh, he, think, he, he pretends that he will come in and negotiate this magic period. And he's saying that to voters who want the period to be zero. Yeah. And they still vote for him. And so what those voters said tonight is, we don't mean it. We, right. the voters of Iowa, we don't really mean in our voting what we say publicly about the absolutism of our abortion position. And we could never have known that without this collapse of the Roe versus Wade regime. And because, like because it is a political faction. Yeah. That's, it's just, yeah. there's a name on it that sounds theological. Right. But what it is, what it has become, what it has evolved to in the Trump era, is a political faction that is anti-democratic, pro-Trump as a strongman leader, and calls it Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. regardless of any link to any theological tradition mm -hmm. whatsoever, and regardless of whether or not they have any link to any church. It's, I am not a Catholic, I am not a Jew, and I am right-wing and willing to get rid of democracy. Mm -hmm. That's what evangelical means in real political and, terms And just right a, now. a personal note on this one, I was working in the Senate in the Roe versus Wade years, I did not believe a single one of the Republican senators working in that building with me actually believed what they said about abortion. I had reason to not believe that a single one meant it. But I did have reason to believe that evangelical Christians in Iowa meant it. Turns out, hmm. yeah. they didn't. Let me, say, at the, let me just interject. Sorry. I'm sorry, I just have to do a little bit no. of business just for a second. Um, at this point in the evening, the projected winner of the Iowa caucuses um, has just started giving his victory speech. Uh, we will keep an eye on that as it happens. Uh, we will let you know if there's any news made in that speech, if there's anything noteworthy, something substantive and important. Um, the reason I'm saying this is, of course, there is a reason that we and other news organizations have generally stopped giving an unfiltered live platform to remarks by former President Trump. It is not out of spite. It is not a decision that we relish. It is a decision that we regularly revisit. Um, and honestly, earnestly, it is not an easy decision. But there is a cost to us as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things. And that is a fundamental truth of our business and who we are. And so his remarks tonight will not air here live. We will monitor them um, and let you know about any news that he makes. Steph, I interrupt you. I was just saying, I believe that's why J.B. Pritzker is not afraid or not answering Joy's Gaza question. Hmm. Because as much as that's a problem for the White House and young voters, what do they have on the other side? Abortion. And an overwhelming amount of young people are going to get up and go and vote and care about a woman's right to choose. So as evangelicals have become superpowers on the right, on the left or the center of the country, millions of people will vote in support of a woman's right to choose. And the White House is calculating that's going to be a bigger number, a bigger issue to help them. So they, they're, they're tangled in this Gaza issue that they don't want to dig deep in. And they're yeah. not as afraid of it as you think they should be. Well, I think they're not as afraid of it. I think they're completely ignoring it, right? And I think the challenge with that, it's thorny for them. It's difficult. They have to choose different Splits constituencies. The Abortion's the an coalition. easier one for them. Right. Yes. But you know what? Michigan is a, is a state you need, and you kind of need the Arab American well, vote the other, there. So they're taking a lot of risks the with biggest that. Th the biggest thing that the Biden campaign is waiting for on that issue is what is the Trump position? And he hasn't said a word about it because, because he doesn't have to, uh, because he's, he's not president. And when you get to September, there, uh, there will be a very clear distinction between Donald Trump and Joe Biden on those issues. And it should be clear to most people that there, by that time, that there's nothing Donald Trump would not do to flatten Gaza as much as anyone in the Israeli government, the most extreme factions of the Israeli government might want to flatten it. And there wouldn't be a moment where Donald Trump ever says to Netanyahu or anyone else in the Israeli government that they should use some restraint. And once, once that contrast is there, the Biden policy, which I hate, versus the Trump policy, which is worse, that's the kind of vote that people have had to cast in this country this, many times. That, that, that point, I think, it, it opens up into a larger one, which is the, the degree to which this sort of lack of an actual campaign here, because it really hasn't. I mean, he's been hanging out in the courtroom, right? There's this, and then you get DeSantis and Haley in the one debate going at each other, right? No one's going at Trump. Means that, like, to your point, 
What does there, the U.S. right now is backing a war in the Middle East, right? Uh, with the with their ally Israel, right? That is enormously controversial in the world. It splits the Democratic coalition. It is an, ama an incredibly important piece of American foreign policy. What does the leading contender for president in the Republican Party think about it? I don't know. No one knows. Uh, no one knows. No, no, no. It's completely, and that is true of a million different things. Yeah. Pick, I mean, I know it feels quaint to like talk about the issues and all this stuff, and we so sort of <laughs> jettison that in this sort of Trump era because he's like this just bizarre, sui generis creature in this way. But at least, you know, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley did answer some questions about substantive stuff the other night in the debate, and the degree to which a lot of the conventions of campaigns and campaign reporting I don't like and have been a critic of for a long time, but. The degree to which he has loosed himself from the shackles of that entirely means that there is no moment on the trail where some reporter or a person gets up in a town hall and literally says, what would you be doing in Gaza? It's the most it's obvious because question. It's because <laughs> the basis of his candidacy is he's running against politics. Right. He's running against politicians. He's running against policy. He's running against the whole idea that a Congress does a thing <laughs> in a country that has a strong man leader. Yeah, right, yeah. He's running for, a, for, for a, a, a situation in which he is the leader. There is no government. There isn't a policy process because there's just what he feels like on a day. Right. Yeah. And that is the form of government right. that he's offering. And that is, I think, what his most enthusiastic supporters like about him. <laughs> this is special coverage of tonight's Iowa Republican caucuses. Right now it is 11 p.m. on the East Coast. It is 10 p.m. in Iowa. Here's where things stand right now. NBC News is projecting that Donald Trump will be the winner of the Iowa caucuses. It was a call the decision desk was able to make pretty early in the night based on entrance polls and very early results. As we continue to get results in from precincts across Iowa, the only question now is, how big Trump's margin of victory is ultimately going to be. The secondary question is who's going to take second place. NBC News is not yet projecting whether Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley will be the second place finisher. How that race shakes out could have major implications for each of their campaigns and therefore for how the rest of the Republican contest will unfold. NBC News has also projected, interestingly, that turnout was lower than expected, lower than expected for tonight's caucuses. Now, that may have, in large part, been due to the frigid temperatures in Iowa, the coldest Iowa caucus day ever. It may be because of political factors. It may be some combination. We don't know. But the projected turnout tonight is about 130,000. That's down from more than 185,000 in 2016 in the Republican caucuses. Now we assume that Nikki Haley will head straight for New Hampshire, where the next votes will be cast next week. That is the, the, the state in which she is polling strongest. It's where polls show her definitely within striking distance of Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis has said that he plans to head not to New Hampshire next, even though that's the next contest. He's planning to head straight to South Carolina before then heading back to New Hampshire to go to a debate later on this week. Donald Trump is headed to New Hampshire as well, but first he plans to make his own very Trumpian stop. He has to stop, well, he doesn't have to. <laughs> He's choosing to stop in New York to attend one of his many trials. This one, a trial beginning tomorrow to determine how much money he has to pay to writer E. Jean Carroll for sexually assaulting and defaming her. This is a trial as to, not as to whether or not the sexual assault happened, but how much he has to pay her in damages because of it. And that's what he's going to do. He doesn't have to do that, but that's what he's going to do before he heads on to New Hampshire, because that's where he thinks the political punch <laughs> is for him. In case you needed any... Any further reminder that this is an election year like no other. And, and it won't impact. I mean, the thing about it is, again, we were talking about these, these heavily religious voters. That, who, it is kind of one of the stunning facts of Donald Trump's political career that no amount of his elocution about sexual assault has impacted negatively his runs for office in any way. I mean, after uh, the Access Hollywood tape, I will never forget being uh, in, uh, in, in Ohio um, and, have, and, and seeing women wear that T-shirt that said, Trump can grab my 
mm. seeing women, you know, at the convention buy and put on that shirt. You know, these were women who would consider themselves to be good Christians who embraced Donald Trump. They didn't reject at all the idea that he would, you know, start by saying, oh, I didn't do that, then saying, you know, I might have done it, and saying, you know what, that's locker room talk, and then saying, so what, I did it, what's wrong with it? And the fact that that, that he's now facing, not the question of whether or not he sexually abused E. Jean Carroll, but just how much money he has to pay her because he lied about it. Yeah. And this will have no impact whatsoever any more than him stealing classified documents or trying to overturn an election and stage a coup. None of it matters. With his base. With his, with his voters. But not necessarily the whole country. That's right. That's a very And with point. Republicans writ large, because sorry, does it matter to Mitch McConnell? Does, apparently not. Does it matter to any of the Republicans who we think behind the scenes despise him? We just saw Doug Burgum, who once said he wouldn't do business with Donald Trump. Turn around and endorse him ahead of the Iowa caucuses. They've all fallen in line. They've all capitulated. They're but, all taking the knee. And I think everything you said is right about that proportion. And then there's the future we don't know, right? Because we don't know, as we've discussed earlier tonight, the independence, the general election, even if one out of ten Republican voters flip on him. And I've been very restrained tonight. I've gone as far as I can. <laughs> um, but most F did say. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yes? The straw that broke the camel's back, what's the secret? A million other straws underneath it. And we just don't know if and when the back will break. Right. But there are all these straws. There are so many convicted Trump aides. I don't believe, check me if I'm wrong, Rachel, that we've mentioned any of them tonight. Mm. He is going into this campaign, and yes, he won Iowa tonight, leaving a trail of convicted aides, lawyers, indicted aides, and a bunch of convicted Trump fans. And so there's a part of the country that wants to lie about that or call it a false flag, or Fox News got in a lot of trouble. They paid a lot of money for platforming those lies repeatedly, and they have confused a lot of people about that. And there's, a, there's that wing. And then there's all these other straws on this camel's back yeah. and all these convicted fans. And one of the big questions that hangs over the trial calendar is whether, if the Supreme Court doesn't delay or stop the coup case, whether Donald Trump will be convicted and sentenced to go join his fans in prison. Now, I can't tell you whether that's going to happen or not, but that's a lot of straws that we haven't yet seen weighed by November. Yeah. Can we broaden yeah. this for a second into uh, More what, what, no, what used to be uh, the politics of these two parties. And, and I think one thing that's consistent in Republicanism through tonight, and what we're talking about here, is uh, Republicans do not behave as absolutists. Uh, they will go with the nominee who represents most of what they think or is closest to what they think, and they don't complain about that. You can't look back at any Republican presidential campaign and find something comparable to the Democratic nominee being complained about because he's not strong enough on climate or she's not strong enough on, uh, you know, international trade the way we want her to be. Uh, th this is a constant in, in Democratic presidential politics. Biden's challenge, big challenge right now, is Gaza, as, as Joy has pointed out. Uh, he has challenges with people who say he's not, you know, doing enough on climate. He has challenges. There are some people who've had all of their student loans forgiven who think he's great and they know he did it. And then there's others who don't have all of their student loans forgiven and they're going, what about my... That doesn't exist on the <laughs> Republican side sure. of politics. It doesn't matter how you vary off of an absolutist position, as long as you're close enough to it, they're all for tax cuts, they're all for supporting guns, and they're all, you know, uh, they're all anti-abortion. And what, what Trump has just identified is, turns out there's some flexibility there too. And so this is a unique challenge on the Democratic side. It's only the Democratic nominee who is challenged within, and it's always the Democratic nominee. It's not just Joe Biden, it's every one of them. You know, Hillary Clinton had real problems because she said the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which actually was the best negotiated trade agreement in American history, she said it was the gold standard of trade agreements and she had to back off and become opposed to it. Yeah. You know, in order to in order to hold that coalition yep. together nothing like that 
ever happens on the Republican and, side. And that's and, and that's because I mean, Jamel Bowie was on my show this week making this 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 a, a similar point about basically that there are policy there's policy trading happening in the Democratic coalition, mm -hmm. right? There's these there's concrete things you want from government, mm -hmm. right? There's concrete policies. It's 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 voting no on TPP or it's student loan forgiveness or it's an end to the war in Gaza. Real and pressure, world problems these are, that government action could exactly. address. Exactly. Yes. And that and and the Republican Party has increasingly operated outside yep. of actual tangible policy trading. And so there was a few funny moments actually where Haley I saw her in Iowa trying to like go at Trump on like ethanol and fuel standards. <laughs> right. And I'm just thinking like yeah like that 12 years ago maybe works but like mm -hmm. they don't they don't, they don't care, man. Yeah. Yeah, you think you're going to like win on some care. They don't have a platform. Stuff? Like, yeah, they're care. operating, they, what is happening here is operating at such a level detached from like Trump. the horse trading around Trump ethanol. Is saying you're welcome to the farmers that he delivered billions of dollars yeah. to in aid from a trade war that, that he, he started. Created. Exactly. But the, but the challenge that you're talking about that Joe Biden is going to face, when it comes to policy, he will be able to rise to it. He hasn't even started campaigning yet. Yeah. And we do have an improving economy. There's a very good chance rates are going to get cut. He passed a massive infrastructure law. He did something on uh, student loans, and he is deeply involved in two wars. So when you talk about that challenge, he will be able to say, on a policy front, I just delivered. And what will no labels say then <laughs> while they're out there going, he's so far to the left and right. Trump's so far to the right. We need something in the middle. Joe Biden's got his report card to show. But you know, Bernie Sanders actually personifies uh, this challenge in democratic presidential politics and he per personifies it in a great way because there's no one to the left of Bernie Sanders <laughs> historically <laughs> in the United States Senate and when he was in the House on virtually every subject and certainly there was no one to his left as a presidential candidate but in the end whether that is the endorsement of the Democratic nominee Bernie Sanders is always there in the United States Senate he goes in wanting a Green New Deal. He wants all of this. But in the end, He's when the vote, vote for is, the IRA. here's right. the thing. It's the thing we can get Joe Manchin on. This yeah. is the best we can do. Bernie Sanders votes for it every yeah. single time, which, which is to say it, that, is, that is the rational compromise process that the Democratic Party requires in order to progress on anything. And, and Bernie Sanders is also old enough to know and remember, live through the lesson that we're living with right now on this Gaza issue, which was it is indescribable how alienated the potential Democratic electorate was from Hubert Humphrey yes. as the Democratic nominee in 1968, presumed to continue Lyndon Johnson's Correct. war policy, which was already a policy aimed at trying to find peace, running against Richard Nixon. And and there was a massive section of the electorate that Bernie Sanders was probably in, certainly knew everyone who was, that said there's no difference. Yeah. There's no difference between Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon. And I heard that from, you know, older people. I was in high school. I kept hearing that. I believed that. There was no difference. Turns out there was a massive Huge difference. difference. Yeah. One of them was a criminal. <laughs> and one of them was an honorable person Slash who Obama was dragged into a policy he didn't like and was trying to work his way out of. And, and so Bernie Sanders had, knows that lesson of, you know, the, the voters who did not show up for Hubert Humphrey, he, by the way, Nixon won by less than 1% of the vote. The voters who didn't show up for Hubert Humphrey because of Vietnam gave it to Richard Nixon. But here's the challenge that the Biden White House has is just that. Is he LBJ in 1968? Because to the point that I think everyone here is making, the Democrats are the polyglot party. Well, wait, it's just a second. The no, LBJ in 1968 was a wild madman who was in the White House <laughs> personally picking bombing targets yeah. in Vietnam. He yes. was stark, raving madman. However, for, so, for these young voters, though, Joe Biden is the guy who's in the White House bypassing Congress to continue to send bombs that are being used on Gaza. I, I'm just telling you the anecdotal evidence from the young people that I, in my yeah, life. There's, that I, nothing, is, going, but there, there's there, nothing going on in the Biden White House that is anything like no, 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 what is happening all, to all. LBJ. But the chat. Chose him, that caused right. him not to run. Well, I totally right. agree. But the issue that the 
the Biden White House has is that the Republican Party is a somewhat monoracial, not completely monoracial, but they're even they're they're as you said, they're ideologically flexible enough to say all we want is our guy to win. That's all we really mm -hmm. care about is right. that we want power and we will elect anyone. They would substitute a different God for Donald Trump if one came right. along and he was and somewhat similar and they will and, they will, and they'll we'll just move yes. on, right? They used to worship George W. Bush, yeah. now they worship yeah. him, they worship Ronald Reagan. It doesn't matter. The Democrats have to steer this yes. ship that's yes. got yes. so yes. many different very hard. In it. Governing the is minute hard. one of them yes. isn't happy, right? Yeah. And they're yeah. trying to meet what you're talking about, which I think is the point, autocracy with politics. Yeah. And the big question we're going to have answered in November is whether politics and cobbling together yeah. political coalitions that are disparate and have different yelling voices that all want different things and are demographically diverse, if you can cobble together that politics and please enough of those people who have real demands, the real yeah. economic, the, the real voters who have economic anxiety are young voters who actually can't afford their lives. Can you cobble together that coalition against a party that will vote in lockstep even for the guy who tells them they they should die in order to vote Stand, in Iowa. Standing up for democracy by showing what democracy right. can do in all of its complications. We actually need to go back to Steve for a second here because we've got 90% of the vote in here. And so we do need to talk about what's happening in Iowa, Steve. Yeah, I mean, we're almost all the way in. And you can see, again, that race for second place here, the margin here, uh, closing in on 2,400 votes for DeSantis over Haley. Uh, again, DeSantis in strong position here when it comes to second place, not in strong position when it's relative to Donald Trump. Um, one thing we're keeping an eye on, too, is the final votes come in. You can see a common color as you look across these 99 counties. There's one piece of gray here. We don't have any votes from Jefferson County, but from the other 98 counties, Donald Trump leads 98 of the 98 counties right now. Wow. There appear to be only two that he may end up falling short in, and he's leading in both of them now. I'll show you them. Johnson County here, again, Iowa City, University of Iowa. Nikki Haley, you can see, is 55 votes behind him with a little bit more to come from Johnson County. She could th uh, theoretically pass him here. That's probably the best opportunity for a candidate to beat Trump in a county that's left on the board. The other one would be Story County. Again, another college county, Iowa State University here, but a little bit more distance here between Trump and Haley. DeSantis didn't do too poorly here, relatively speaking. Those are really the only two that Trump appears to be in danger. We talked about Northwest Iowa, where DeSantis was leading in Sioux County earlier. Trump has taken control there. You look up at Lyon County, almost all the voters in. Again, these were just, these were atrocious counties for Donald Trump in 2016. He's just powering through them tonight. Ultimately, the reason why DeSantis seems to be ahead of Haley here is, again, we've talked about it, places like Dallas County. Haley is finishing second here, but that's just, she, she beat DeSantis only by 80 votes. She needed a bigger pad than that there. Uh, you know, a place like Story County, she needed to be ahead of DeSantis by more because when you expand, to look at all 99 counties, counties, there are a lot of small rural counties in Iowa that individually aren't going to get you a lot of votes, that, but collectively add up. And in the small rural counties, Haley has really fallen short. There are 23 counties on this board, I could show you, 23 counties where Nikki Haley is running in single digits tonight. And they are predominantly small rural counties. I'll just give you an example here. Look at this. You know, Van Buren County, Trump dominating. Haley's getting six percent of the vote right here. 23 where she's in single digits. How many were DeSantis is in single digits? There are four of 99 where he's in single digits. So he's just gotten the better of her in those rural, lower income, smaller counties. And she hasn't got the kind of pad she needs in the places where she's stronger. And here we oh, go back in Iowa. And here we are in the five Nebraska, beautiful state. <laughs> here we are back in Iowa with 90 percent in. And again, DeSantis well positioned there for second place. Trump, again, we had said the record for the highest vote chair uh, in a Republican caucus in Iowa was 41 percent. George W. Bush, 2000. He's blown past that. He looks like he's going to finish above 50 percent here, very likely an outright majority. We've never seen that in a Republican race before. Um, and then uh, in terms of the margin here, again, it was 12 points. 1988 was the previous record. Uh, it looks like it'll be something like 30 here tonight for Trump.
Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I just, you know, the, 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 there's 99 counties in Iowa, and, and the full Grassley, right, is the term that we give to visiting <laughs> yeah. all the 99 counties. Ron DeSantis did the full Grassley, and tonight I think we have to coin <laughs> the full DeSantis, which is when you do the full Grassley and you lose <laughs> every, all of single, every single county. Oh, nobody. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever done that. Well, I mean, not only that, nobody spent more time in Iowa than Ron DeSantis, and nobody yeah. spent less time than Donald Trump. Trump. Exactly. There's a famous story about, you know, one of the biggest upsets in Iowa Republican caucus history, in Iowa caucus history, was 1980 when Ronald Reagan had like a 30-point lead in December and then lost the caucuses to George Bush Sr. It's really the birth of the Bush dynasty was in those Iowa caucuses in 1980, and the reason why Bush ended up catching Reagan and winning by two points was just days before the caucuses, they had a novelty a, a bit at the times, a televised debate, and Ronald Reagan Reagan, the front runner who was crushing everybody in the polls said, I'm skipping the debate. Mm. And all the candidates on stage said, he's insulting you, Iowans. He's taking you for granted. And the Iowans said, yes, he is. And they gave victory to George H.W. Uh, Bush. That launched a Bush boomlet, made him vice president, son's careers and everything. But Reagan paid a price in 1980 for skipping the debate. Trump has skipped every single debate, and we've only seen his support really go up. Well, I, should, I have something to add here. Um, as you said, Chris, um, Ron DeSantis did do the full Grassley, go to all 99 counties, and then apparently lose all 99 counties. Another candidate did the full Grassley twice. Vivek Ramaswamy went to all 99 <laughs> counties. Oh, twice. A double Grassley? He did a double Grassley <laughs> in this know. campaign and, this is news, NBC News has just confirmed that Vivek Ramaswamy will be dropping out of the race. Wow. Likely Why? this evening. Wow. Why? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, seriously, it was just a, a campaign for fame. It wasn't yeah. about winning anything. He can afford to keep hanging around and going to states. I don't understand. I why think he's count. locked up the podcast. Yeah, so okay. I think the game All right. is done. Oh my God, um, him on the debate stage. Oh yeah. Thank God. I, well, you can so always invite him onto your show whenever you feel like it. That's tough. That is a tough one. <laughs> you could set him to be your ringtone to wake you up in the morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, joining us now from the Trump victory party in Des Moines, where Donald Trump has finished his his victory speech, is NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard. Von, how'd it go? Rachel, he spoke for about 20 minutes from the stage, and I'll just read you a quote from one of his lines. Quote, this is our third win, but this is our biggest, talking about the Iowa caucuses. Of course, Donald Trump lost the 2016 Iowa caucus to Ted Cruz, but wow. uh, reality, Donald Trump is not tethered to. And frankly, the first person he shouted out, if I may, from the stage within the first 60 seconds was Kerry Lake, the, the Senate candidate out of Arizona. He then gave Vivek Ramaswamy a shout out, saying that he congratulated him for going from zero to eight percent and then perhaps notably he without mentioning them referred to Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis calling them very smart people and capable people this is a campaign operation around Donald Trump that has been eager to wrap up this nomination they have been vocal in that they believe that they can get to the delegate threshold meet that threshold come March 19th in order to become the presumptive nominees and frankly if I may guys this is Donald Trump I was I was listening to him out of my left ear. I was listening to you guys in my right ear. And I heard the name Doug Burgum mentioned. He was up on stage. <laughs> The only Republican to have dropped out from this Republican race who appeared on that presidential debate stage was Doug Burgum. And who did he endorse? He endorsed Donald Trump. And guess who was on that stage tonight? Doug Burgum. Tim Scott, Mike Pence, they've stayed on the sidelines. Well, we had conversations about coalescing, and it's hard. You guys, I was here in Iowa eight years ago, and I took an overnight flight to New Hampshire, and it is hard to not feel like so much of what we lived through eight years ago is exactly what we are about to go through here in these days ahead and these weeks ahead. Well, can I just ask you, you mentioned right off the bat that the first person who Trump shouted out from the stage uh, was Carrie Lake, who's a failed Republican Senate candidate um, uh, from Arizona. Did he shout her out because she's there or what was going on there? Uh, yes, she's actually been a surrogate for him out here for a couple days. I think it's worth everybody having the context that the superstars of the Republican Party today, perhaps the most influential folks you could have by your side are people like Carrie Lake. You know, I go back to one rally that I went to in South Dakota, I believe about two months ago, and I was asking folks who do they want to be the vice presidential pick, and person after person, 
Uh, named to me Carrie Lake, but Marjorie Taylor Greene is also here. Matt Gates is here. Ronnie Jackson is here. Byron Donalds is here. Laura Loomer is here. These are folks that in the modern day Republican Party are those folks that Donald Trump turned to in the closing days. I was about two hours north of Des Moines earlier today for a rally in which all of them were appearing together. And this is the cast that Donald Trump has had. I was just talking to Carrie Lake uh, uh, here on stage right before Donald Trump took to it. And I asked her the question, you know, to those who say that it's folks like Donald Trump and Carrie Lake that it costs, you know, the Republicans a general election, what would you tell them? And she told me, well, if it weren't for rigged elections, we would have won. This is a message that they are going to take with them to the ballot box this upcoming November, guys. Ron Hilliard for us at, at Trump campaign headquarters, making it clear as it could possibly be that the Trump movement, uh, which now appears to be as ascendant it's ever, as it's ever been in Republican politics, is 100 percent in on um, uh, election denialism is, a, is, is, I believe, the politest way to put it, but it's an anti-democratic movement, anti-small-d democratic movement. There's an election alert on your screen right now because NBC News, the decision desk, can now project that in addition to Donald Trump as the projected winner of Iowa, the projected second-place finisher in Iowa is Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis projected to be the second-place finisher in the Iowa Republican caucuses. Nikki Haley projected to be the third-place finisher in the Iowa Republican caucuses. You see this is with about 91% of the vote in. You see it's a tight difference uh, between DeSantis and Haley, but the decision desk believes they've got enough. The decision desk believes they have seen enough now uh, to project that that will be the numerical order of the finishers um, in Iowa tonight. Steve Kornacki, looking at that call from the decision desk, can you give us any of a, a, a sense of what's behind it? Uh, obviously, looking at that map right now, it's not that helpful. Every <laughs> single county in the state appears to have been won by Donald Trump. But in the fight for second and third, um, it looks like Ron DeSantis has prevailed. Yeah, and again, for those reasons we've been talking about, I think it essentially came down to the, the smaller rural counties. DeSantis got more relative to Haley out of those than Haley got relative to DeSantis in the suburban and urban counties. Certainly it was close. It kept us, it was the, the most suspenseful race within a race we've been watching tonight. Um, but again, you just looked at those suburban areas. Haley did well. She wanted to do better. And she just, you know, we, we, the problem with the coalition she had has. And I think this can be a problem for her if this campaign goes forward with her. Certainly it will in New Hampshire, and we can talk about what might uh, await beyond. But the problem for her in these results, when you get past New Hampshire, where independents are going to be such a disproportionately large part of the electorate, is you look at what the core of the Republican Party demographically is these days in so many states that are going to vote. You're talking about rural areas, you're talking about exurban areas, you're talking about voters uh, on the lower end of the economic spectrum, you're talking about voters without uh, uh, college degrees, without postgraduate degrees. Um, Nikki Haley in those areas of this state didn't just do bad, she did awful. As I said, she's in single digits in, in almost a quarter of the counties in the state. And when you have that kind of imbalance, you know, tonight you fall just short of second place at DeSantis, but again, when this race gets cooking, if it gets cooking past New Hampshire, will you, what do you do with a coalition like that in Texas? What do you do with a coalition like that in Tennessee, in North Carolina, in Arkansas, in Alabama? I'm naming states that are coming up on Super Tuesday that are potentially winner-take-all states. Um, this is just a coalition. I, I talked earlier about the example of John McCain in 2000. He showed the, he pushed that, that coalition as far in 2000 as it absolutely could get but it broke for lack of support from core Republicans and, frankly, for antagonism of core Republicans for going and getting your support from sort of outside the party and from a very specific faction within the party. So that's the challenge for Haley coming out of here. The challenge for DeSantis while he gets second place is who's bounced back from a second place finish in Iowa and gone on to win a Republican presidential nomination in the past, Ronald Reagan, 1980. He only lost Iowa by two points and he was the overwhelming national front runner when he did it. Bush senior in 1988, third place in Iowa, but got the nomination, but he was the national front runner in the polls when he lost Iowa. The combination of losing, losing this big and already being buried in the national polls, no second place finisher in Iowa has ever come from there to win a Republican presidential nomination or even come close.
Two pieces of news to update you on. We mentioned that NBC News had confirmed that Vivek Ramaswamy would be dropping out of the race tonight. He has dropped out of the race tonight, and he has endorsed Donald Trump for president. No surprise there. Um, we also now have a new projection from the decision desk. It was very early on in the evening when the decision desk projected that Donald Trump would be the winner in Iowa. The decision desk now projects, NBC News now projects, that Donald Trump's um, proportion of the vote in Iowa will exceed 50 percent, um, which was a benchmark that his campaign was looking for. I think a lot of people who thought he would do well thought that he wouldn't do so well that he would hit that benchmark, but he has done so. Um, right now, if we're going to go live to Iowa, where we're hearing from the second place winner, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, basically staked his entire campaign on doing well in Iowa. Uh, this is his chance to react to his, his second place showing here tonight. Let's listen. The decline of this country and to give this country country a new birth of freedom and a restoration of sanity. That's what we are going to do. So we have our marching orders. Our marching orders are to do all we can to preserve what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty. The same fire that burned in Philadelphia in 1776 when our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence. The same sacred fire of liberty that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg when our first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, pledged our nation to a new birth of freedom. The same sacred fire of liberty that was on the beaches of Normandy in 1944 when our band of brothers stormed those shores and helped free the world. The same sacred fire of liberty that was at the Berlin Wall in 1987 when Ronald Reagan stood there and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This is our responsibility, to carry this torch and to preserve this sacred fire of liberty. Don't run away from this responsibility. We welcome this responsibility. We thank you for your effort. We thank you for your support. You helped us get a ticket punched out of the Hawkeye State. We have a lot of work to do, but I can tell you this, as the next president of the United States, I am going to get the job done for this country. I am not. I am not going to make any excuses, and I guarantee you this, I will not let you down. Thank you all. God bless you. DeSantis giving remarks tonight in Iowa after a second place finish, a distant second place finish, uh, nearly 30 points behind the first place finish of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, again, NBC News decision desk is projecting that his proportion of the vote will exceed 50 percent at the end of the night. Now, I believe, control room, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe we are still expecting remarks sometime soon from Nikki Haley. We're expecting her to speak in Iowa as well. So we'll get you the Nikki Haley remarks when she gives those as well. But we have uh, uh, had, the, had the field shrink yet again tonight. Vivek Ramaswamy will never again grace our television screens as a presidential candidate. Oh, David yeah. Pluff, are you shocked with the Trump <laughs> endorsement that apparently um, went along with his, uh, his, his bowing out? Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd like his total number of votes must have been what eight, ten thousand, something mm. like that. Think about that. All that time, <laughs> going to all the counties twice, all the money, remarkable. Yeah, uh, but the podcast, the yeah, podcast, yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna have. Oh, he does have a. Po There's and, a podcast. And he I might think. have a Fox show in 2025. So yeah. Well. Only I mean, the best. Yeah. only Ben Shapiro has a more annoying voice. So I guess there's a future if Ben can do it. He can do it. I will say about him. I sometimes feel like I've totally lost my mind covering American politics, um, and, and Trump makes you feel that way all the time. There was one kind of little thing I was holding on to, which is that like the polling was very consistent. The more Republicans saw of him, the less they liked him. <laughs> and I just felt like, okay, I'm like, I'm just like, not, <laughs> not just me, it's not just me, it's crazy here. Yeah. Yeah. Like, my impression of this is the same as the as the no. median Republican voter. The Thank thing you. that was so amazing was, and the thing I will miss about Vivek Ramaswamy is the way and the special special way 
that Nikki Haley despised. <laughs> I feel like her red hot intense. hatred yes. of him was just, it, it was fun its own watch. thing. It was yeah. fun to watch, it was entertaining, and I'll miss it. We'll but miss this that. idea that, you know, Donald Trump didn't even try, he didn't even show up for the debates, that's not true. He might not have been in Iowa. He had a huge, well organized yes. machine in the state of Iowa. And he might not have participated in those debates, but in 2024, with political TV, a broadcast TV, a streaming TV, every social media outlet, he almost doesn't need to. So I feel like the Trump campaign is going to kind of want to flex here and say, like, everyone just came to us no matter what. They were working hard. Mm. And while he goes to all these trials, why is he going there? Because all our TV cameras are there. And we're not at his rallies, but he's using them as stump speeches. So his whole, like, you all come to me, Please. He takes every media opportunity he can, and there's a lot of It will be interesting to see what happens this week. There is a New Hampshire Republican debate. I think we can assume that Donald Trump will not participate in it. Mm -hmm. We know that Vivek Ramaswamy will not be in it. It will presumably just be Haley and DeSantis again if both choose to participate. Is there the same percentage for each of them in participating well, um, I, heading into New Hampshire? I think they, they're both beginning, if they hadn't already, uh, the, the presidential campaign of four years from now. I, I think they both know they're not getting this nomination. And the question is, how do, we, how do I exit this campaign? How do I build up capital with these voters who will never again in their lives get a chance to vote for Donald Trump? This is their last time. There won't be another Donald Trump candidacy for years I have years so much to say about that. And, <laughs> and so, you can just stop it with so, another chance to so vote. They, you can yeah, stop which it there is part of the ingratiation game they have been playing with these voters, because these are going to be the voters who decide the next Republican nomination four years from now. But, I mean, the challenge for Ron DeSantis, I could see Nikki Haley having a second life. She's been UN, she's an ambassador to the UN. She can say she's been for Trump, against Trump. She sort of fudges her position. Ron DeSantis torched his state for this. He blew up his state. He put a six-week abortion ban in place. He ran Republicans around Tallahassee like his pets. And they are unhappy with him. He can't go back to Florida. There's no goodwill in Tallahassee for him because he forced Republicans to take some really ugly votes and went to war against Disney, and went to war against the cruise industry, and ruined the construction industry, and ruined the, uh, the, industry, the agricultural industry, and chased workers away. You could go on and on about the ways in which he's hurt. He's dismantled education and turned it into, you know, anti-LGBTQ mania, um, which is not great for tourism, anti-blackness, like all of the enemies that he's created. I'm not sure what he does between now and 2028 that could actually get him back on a path to run for president again, because what does he have to show for it? He's going to go back as a... There are already people in Tallahassee trying to undo some of the laws that they passed for him. If Donald they Trump wins in 2024, do we think there's going to be a 2028? Well, there won't be, well, there won't be anymore. There won't be anymore. I mean, He'll just be this the might character. be the last one. Yeah. Raise your hand. Well, yeah, there's, also, there's also just, you know, timing is... I mean, you know this better than anyone, right? Timing is everything in politics, and particularly in presidential politics. And this was like the great question of Barack Obama, freshman senator in, you know, sworn in in 2005, convention speech in 2004 obviously he can't go, turn around and run for president a year and a half or two years later in 2007 and he did and it turned out to be the right call chris christie you know i think kind of miss miss missed the moment that he had i think ron DeSantis was too late to get in the it's, race it's like the yeah. timing does matter it's the john uh, yeah. mccain model it's the one where you you run in 2000 you come in second right. and you get the nomination the next time that that's a play that people yeah, have run many many times i think it's really interesting for haley though so let's say eight days from now she wins the new hampshire primary a big if but if she does she has to decide is that it am i going to go meekly into the night I'm actually going to try and win this thing. Mm -hmm. And if she tries to win this thing, she's actually going to turn off even more Trump voters than she yeah. is today. So that's going to be fascinating to watch. Speaking of timing, speaking of Haley, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has just started speaking in New Hampshire. She's come in third in Iowa. Let's check out what she's got to say. I want to say to Rena and Josh and Naylan, I am so proud of you. The best job I will always have is being your mom. I want to thank my parents who are at home. Every day they reminded us how blessed we were to live in America. I want to thank my sweet brother who came out here and was caucusing for me. A 
good Desert Storm um, veteran, and I want to thank my other siblings there. I want to thank Michael's parents, Bill and Carol Haley, who've been fantastic along the way as well. Um, you can't do this without the strength of your family. I want to congratulate President Trump on his win tonight. We have had an amazing 11 months here in the Hawkeye State. I came to Iowa early and often, and I kept coming back. Even though the cold weather is brutal. But the kindness of Iowans will never be lost on me. You're faithful, patriotic, and hardworking Americans. And I will forever be grateful for the time that we had. <laughs> At one point in this campaign, there were 14 of us running. I was at 2% in the polls. But tonight, Iowa did what Iowa always does so well. The pundits will analyze the results from every angle. We get that. But when you look at how we're doing in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, and beyond, say, tonight, Iowa made this Republican primary a two-person race. <laughs> tonight, tonight, I will be back in the great state of New Hampshire. And the question before Americans is now very clear. Do you want more of the same? No. Or do you want a new generation of conservative leadership? a lot of hard truths to America. And here's another one. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve in his administration. But when I say more of the same, you know what I'm talking about. It's both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. They have more in common than you think. 70% of Americans don't want another Trump-Biden rematch. <laughs> A majority disprove of both of them. Yeah. Trump and Biden are both about 80 years old. Yes. <laughs> Trump and Biden both put our country trillions of dollars deeper in debt, and our kids will never forgive them for it. Yeah. Trump and Biden both lack a vision for our country's future, because both are consumed by the past, by investigations, by vendettas, by grievances. America deserves better. Yeah. under new conservative leadership. We deserve a president who will focus on the needs of our people, not on themselves. A president who will rebuild our economy, close our border, and stand up 
to our enemies. Most importantly, we deserve a president who will stop our self-loathing, end division and fear, and make America strong and proud. Our campaign is the last best hope of stopping the Trump-Biden nightmare. But it's more than that. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to earn the support of a majority of Americans. Right. Yes. All, all the evidence says that if it's a Trump-Biden rematch, it's going to be another toss-up election. It could go either way. We could have more disputes over election interference. And Joe Biden could win again. Nope. With Kamala Harris waiting in the wings. Lord help us if that happens. And then look at what happens when I go head to head against Biden. That means no recounts, no lawsuits, and no doubts. It means no more Chuck Schumer leading the Senate. No more endless votes for House Speaker because we'll have a huge House majority. term limit the do-nothing Washington politicians. We'll rebuild our economy and secure our border. No more excuses. And make no mistake, we will restore our national pride. We are blessed to live in America, and it's time that we remember that. And as we head to New Hampshire, I have one more thing to say. We're going to win! Yeah. <laughs> Underestimate me, because that's always fun. so many great supporters. And I only have time to mention a few, but it's important. Marlis Papma. Many of you know and love Marlis, who has been a conservative fighter. A fired up Nikki Haley in New Hampshire thanking a room of her fired up supporters. She came in a close third place in Iowa uh, just after Ron DeSantis, but she declared tonight that Iowa has made this a two-person race. She said, I will go to New Hampshire tonight. All eyes, in fact, do turn to New Hampshire, where Haley does have a real shot of potentially winning next week's primary. Joining us now from Manchester, New Hampshire, specifically the Yankee Lanes Bowling Alley in Manchester. Oh, I know well. Oh, <laughs> go on, hit it. Go on. Go on. I've been waiting all night for this, Rachel. Hold on one sec. Go on, Katie. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Come on, get there. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's going to get there. Oh. It's a okay, it's okay. Here's the thing, Nikki Haley <laughs> is hoping gotta she's put not the gonna roll. In the, they got to put the bumpers in the gutters. Ball. Yes, the yeah. bumpers. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Katie. Wait, sorry, hold, sorry, on, sorry. hold on, 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 hold
can do it. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Got this. You got this. You got this. You got this. Well right, that done. was much better. It was much, much better. better. All right, now, now so the Nikki Haley yes. does not want to roll a gutter ball here in New Hampshire. I've been talking to a lot of voters here, and I keep hearing over and over and over again, they wanted to see her prove that she has a chance tonight in Iowa. That was a second place win. There were some that said, if she comes in a close third, okay. But here's the thing, voters in this state, Republican voters tell me they want another option. And they see Nikki Haley as the best shot at another option. But it's not just Republican voters, it's Democratic voters as well who say, they don't entirely like Biden, and they're looking for someone else as well. Listen to a conversation I had with a lovely lady named Mariah a little bit earlier at the bowling alley. Here's how she described it. I am heavily left. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that both sides could do better. Yeah. Do you think democracy is in danger? Oh, yeah. 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 Do you think New Hampshire is going to go for Donald Trump or Nikki Haley? Hope Haley. Yeah? I hope Haley. Would you consider Haley? Yes. You would? Yeah. Even though you're heavily liberal? Yes. Why? I, because I think both sides have had their fill of old white men. Mm. And it's time for younger, more new blood to come in that have broader scope and are willing to work with the other side. Because right now it's just toddlers screaming over their toys and wanting to go home and wanting to win. So maybe give a woman a shot? I know. Funny. <laughs> If it's Haley versus Biden, who would you vote for? Haley. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, mostly over his politics with Israel right now. Huh. Yeah. Would her politics be much different? I think that she's more willing to listen and negotiate than what Biden's doing right now. He's just throwing money. So Biden might have some trouble in New Hampshire? Yes. Among Democrats? Yes. Wow. So I heard that over and over again, not just from Mariah there, but from other voters who said that they've been voting Democratic their whole lives. They've switched their party affiliation, voted Republican. They're going to in the primary next week. And they tell me that it's not just about next week. They do want somebody other than Joe Biden on the ticket. The state is also pretty offended that Joe Biden took away their first to vote yep. um, status here and moved it to South Carolina. They're super angry about that here in this state. And they want to change. They want to see something else. That being said, Nikki Haley out of South Carolina, you've been talking about it all night, doesn't have the clearest path. I've heard it described more as a deer trail. But she's hoping she can be more like John McCain in 08 or Bill Clinton in 92, find some momentum in this fiercely independent state and prove to voters, independent-minded voters or voters who just don't love Trump as much as we think they do in South Carolina and beyond that she can do it. The problem is, we just saw in Iowa that he is still so intensely popular with the core of the Republican Party. The, the MAGA core of the Republican Party has just taken over so completely that it's hard to see what her path is. By the way, the name that I did not hear, not even once in this state while I was here, Ron DeSantis. Yeah. He hasn't been there. They can't, they don't know who he is, they can't spell it. Um, not likely to be a, a factor. They're not even heading straight to, uh, to New Hampshire um, out of his second place finish in Iowa tonight. Katie Turret, the Yankee Lanes bowling alley in Manchester, New Hampshire, and getting better at the sport with every <laughs> take. Thank you, my friend. We are going to, yes, yes, do it. Go on, go on. Come on. Look at the Give it to us. Come on. Oh, very nice. Well done, Katie. Well done. Well done. Well done. Much appreciated. Yeah. I can't wait, you know, that talking to that voter about. But she's got, I can't oh, wait till Mariah Googles Nikki uh, Haley's position on, on Gaza Israel. Yeah. If and Israel and the Palestinians. It was also does. like the but perfect if she, voter interview. Like, that's yeah. like, people are cross pressured and they're also not necessarily at this point paying a ton of attention. And they have feelings like, for instance, uh, I don't want more old white men or I'm angry at Joe Biden about the, his right. position of God. Like, but if that is real, that's real. That's real. Single issue treatment of the Palestinians voter. Correct. And then you say, and therefore, my candidate is Nikki Haley. Yes. That is yes. a very fast run down a very short street. Yeah, the thing that's so interesting is what that voter kind of displayed to me is kind of what's happening in my household, right? Is that the people, the young people
people I know that are around me, they had three beefs with Joe Biden. Beef number one was his age, which seemed completely unfair. I remember having huge arguments in Jamaica. We were at my godmother's 90th birthday party. We're fighting with them. That's like, he cannot help that. And Trump is the same age, but he reads older than Trump to young people. And so they're mad that they feel like they only have a choice of two elderly men. And they see Biden as reading so much more older, older and more feeble. That's their first beef. Second was student loans, which a lot of the messaging hasn't been there so that they understand that but Biden actually accomplished that. Forgiven. A lot of it forgiven. And that's getting better. And I think he's improved on that, right? And Ron DeSantis has articulated the Republican position as, if you want your student loans forgiven, declare bankruptcy. <laughs> right. That's a right. great plan uh, for America. And the third one Thank is you. Gaza. And Gaza was sort of strike three for a lot of young, for a lot of young voters. And so they are cross-pressured, but these are things that are causing them yeah. to look at someone like Nikki Haley because her hair is black. She seems younger. They, they're, they're looking for an alternative that isn't Biden, but the problem is the alternatives to Biden are much further to the on right on Gaza issues, on for the issues, issues they care about. They're much further to the David right. Plouffe, watching Nikki Haley give that speech, obviously she's good at delivering a speech. She's fired up. She's speaking to a fired up room. She was polished. She got a much better response from her room than Ron DeSantis did from his. What did you make of the content of what she was saying there? Well, first, DeSantis came in second, but he looked like he was coming out of a root canal. <laughs> I mean, there was no energy. Was I think this is a guy a bad who speaker. at it least understands internally that the road is, is over for him. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a very compelling message. I don't think it's going to get her the Republican nomination, but in terms of the message for New Hampshire voters, and, and if she's able to win New Hampshire after that, she had a case. And I think that's going to yeah. be, we were talking about this earlier, if she actually wants to try and win the Republican nomination this year, she's going to have to lay more wood on Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, even if that could cause her trouble down the way. And what that suggests is she's probably going to be willing to do that. What I thought was interesting about it in terms of the way she laid the wood, because I think Steve Kornacki has been correct that it is it can be very dangerous to go after him, right? And if you go after him in ways or separate yourself in ways that look like they're playing into the liberal media or into the enemy, then you hurt yourself. The sort of general generational let's move on. Let's let's move to the forward of the past. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't like he's do you know he's going to a <laughs> civil trial where he's found liable for sexual abuse tomorrow like it wasn't that and it wasn't he's a threat to american democracy it was let's move on like do we want to be mired in this do we want to do this want again to do that. and that i think that if there's a way to thread the needle that's probably she the said i am the answer our campaign is the answer to the trump biden nightmare i thought she was declaring a no labels or third can third party oh, candidate it's the strongest anti trump speech this side of Chris Christie's uh, speeches as a candidate and Chris Christie's really great final speech as a candidate. Uh, so it seems to answer David's question before she spoke about basically, you know, is she running for the nomination this year or not? That's the speech you give yeah. if you're running this year. Yeah. yeah, but I do. I mean, there is the potential for a third party candidacy. Um, that is not there, there is a this this no labels group that has been trying to get ballot position all around the country, and they have some in some um, key states. If Nikki Haley does, let's say she wins New Hampshire or she does well in New Hampshire, but then she gets shellacked in the rest of the primary, and Donald Trump's going to be the Republican nominee. If Nikki Haley ran, ran, as she said tonight, to be the answer to the Trump Biden nightmare, the solution to that, if she ran against Trump and Biden, against Trump and Biden, against Trump and Biden, I'm the candidate who's neither of those things. Who I would love to see that poll. Ruins. Who's, who, whose chances does she spoil? Yeah. Does she take voters away from Trump more than she does from Biden? I mean, that would be my sense, because it gives Republicans who would never vote for Biden a place to go. I think that's highly unlikely. But the, the third party, this deserves a lot more attention, I think, than it's getting. Because even if no labels doesn't field anybody, and we know historically third parties, if they're polling a 10, they get two. But if this collection of existing third party candidates, not to mention no labels, were to get five, six, seven, Donald Trump winning the presidency like he did it in 2016 with 47 percent of the vote is a much different uh, challenge than 50 percent. We have much more of our special coverage of the Iowa caucuses still ahead. And a reminder, we will be here Thursday night this week at 11 p.m. Eastern for coverage of this week's New Hampshire debate. I wonder who's going to be in it. Stay with us.
It is midnight here in New York, 11 p.m. in Iowa, where tonight, caucus goers braved record low temperatures, gathered in gyms, churches, and schools across the state, and gave us the first tangible look at where Republican voters stand right now. And tonight, Iowa Republicans delivered a resounding victory to Donald Trump. Nothing hugely surprising there, but we'll still talk about what that means. With me here at the table is an all-star panel, former Obama campaign manager, MSNBC political analyst, and as I always like to say, my old boss, David Bluff, and the host of The Weekend on MSNBC, Michael Steele, Simone Sanders Townsend, and Alicia Menendez. Everybody's working very hard over the past couple of days. <laughs> uh, NBC News can project that Donald Trump will exceed 50% tonight. We can also project that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis DeSantis will finish second, which is a bit surprising coming into tonight. We'll bring you any updated numbers as soon as we get them, and we will stay close with our decision desk and, of course, the one and only Steve Karnacki. The field has also one candidate smaller tonight. Vivek Ramaswamy announced he is dropping out of the race and endorsing Donald Trump. And for Trump, this is on track to be the largest margin of victory by a Republican in Iowa caucus history, by a lot, actually. The largest margin of victory for a candidate, as a reminder, currently facing 91 charges across four criminal cases. And when it comes to those many charges across those many cases, most Iowa caucus goers do not seem at all concerned. According to NBC News entrance polls, about two thirds of them, two thirds, say that even if Trump is convicted, he is still fit to be president. And of course, those who do believe that overwhelmingly voted for him tonight, and we saw that in the numbers as well. And in case you were wondering, we also learned tonight from those very same entry polls that the big lie is very much alive and well among Iowa's Republican caucus goers. About two thirds of them still say President Joe Biden did not legitimately win the 2020 election. He, of course, definitely did. Now, with an Iowa win under Donald Trump's belt, Traditionally, it would be time to head straight to New Hampshire. That's usually what candidates do. I mean, they usually get on planes, they wake up, they go to pit stops, they, they go to diners. That's usually what they do, but not for Trump. Instead, he will make a pit stop, a different kind of one, in a New York City courtroom for the start of a trial tomorrow that will determine how much he has to pay writer E. Jean Carroll for defaming her after she accused him of sexual abuse. Again, that is the guy who's hovering a little over 50% of the vote in the state of Iowa right now. It's worth just repeating that. We have so much to talk about, but first, let's get right to Steve Karnacki at the big board. Steve, take us inside the numbers. There are some surprises tonight, I would say. Um, yeah, <laughs> actually, one late-breaking surprise. Maybe we'll start with that. It is a blowout win for Trump, as you can see, and DeSantis edging Haley for second place. It looked until about uh, 15 minutes ago that Donald Trump was going to go 99 for 99 and win every single county in Iowa. And then the final batch of votes came in where? In Johnson County. This is where Iowa City and the University of Iowa is. And just check this out. We think, not entirely sure, but we think this is all the votes in Johnson County now. And look at this. Nikki Haley, in the end, winning by one vote over Donald Trump. So the difference of one vote in Johnson County may, and it seems will, prevent Donald Trump from having a 99-county sweep. Literally the difference of one vote, an interesting nugget at the end of the night. Johnson County, of course, actually has the highest concentration of college degrees of any county in Iowa. Uh, no surprise, it's where the University of Iowa is, but we had talked about that being sort of the backbone of Haley's coalition that she had built in Iowa. College degrees, higher incomes, suburban, urban, metropolitan dwellers. So, you know, this is a county tailor-made to her, and it does look like she's going to be, that's going to be the only county she wins, the only county a non-Trump candidate wins. You know, Haley did, was competitive, but frankly a little disappointing, I think, for her campaign here in Dallas County, big suburban county uh, outside Des Moines. I think the Haley campaign thought they could get closer, maybe even beat Trump there. You look at Polk County, this is the biggest county in the state by far, where Des Moines is, Des Moines, a lot of suburbs in there, too. Haley finishing, I think, a surprise, still a few more votes here, but maybe may end up finishing third place here, also a disappointment for her. But these are the areas where she ran the best. And I, I start with her because if anybody in the next contest in New Hampshire is going to give Trump a run there, it's going to be Nikki Haley. That's what all the polls show, certainly. And demographically, the group she did the best with in Iowa tonight, independent voters. In her exit poll, she almost caught Donald Trump with them. Independent voters made up 16% of this electorate in New Hampshire tonight, in, uh, in Iowa tonight, in New Hampshire next week. They could make up 
45% or so of the electorate. So that is what could give Nikki Haley a chance next week. If you just look at the independents here, there's like three times as many of them in the New Hampshire electorate la uh, next week. And all the polling in New Hampshire has showed her leading with independents so far. For Donald Trump, though, this is just a story of counties. He won in 2016. His margin just absolutely exploded. And I think the most notable thing for Trump is counties that were that are the most evangelical and church going in the state were the most resistant to him. Some of the most resistant to him back in 2016, including Sioux County here. This was Donald Trump's worst county in Iowa in 2016. He got 11% of the vote here. Look at that. He wins it by double digits tonight from 11 to 45%. He jumped 34 points in this county, this county, and so many others. You know, there were 42 counties in Iowa that went for Mike Huckabee, who won the evangelical vote in 2008 and won the state, who went for Rick Santorum, won the evangelical vote in 2012, won the state, and went for Ted Cruz in 2016 over Trump. Cruz won the evangelical vote, won the state. 42 counties fit that criteria. Trump swept all 42 of those counties. So that bond he has with evangelical voters that he's really formed after the 2016 Iowa caucuses, you really see what it's turned into eight years later uh, in these results. And as you mentioned, this is a it shatters two records. The previous margin, the pre previous best margin in a Republican caucus was 12 points, 1988, Bob Dole over Pat Robertson. And the 51%, that is fully 10 points higher than the previous high vote share on the Republican side in Iowa. That was George W. Bush back in 2000. Bush, of course, did go on to win the nomination. If anybody thinks their vote doesn't count, Johnson County has wants to have a word with you. Steve Karnacki, one question I have before I let you go is just about, I mean, Ron DeSantis, he was, he's been losing, uh, gain, he's been losing in the polls over the last couple of uh, polls by the Des Moines Register. He's been losing steam, I should say. Where in the state did he do better than expected that really stood out to you? I don't know if it was doing better than expected as much as it was Haley just doing worse. Mm. Um, I, I, I see a couple examples here were, well, Frank, oh, let me get the, I'll show you. Again, just go back into Dallas County. Haley was supposed to be beating him by a bigger margin here. Um, this is an underperformance by Haley in this county. It might be a bit of an overperformance for DeSantis, too, but this is a place Haley was supposed to do better. And there's a lot of votes. That, it doesn't, may not look like a lot of votes if you're used to seeing some other bigger states, but that's a lot of votes in these caucuses. That's, that's not a good showing for Haley right there. Um, and we mentioned Polk County, actually. This is a really bad showing for Haley, finishing behind. Again, she should be in second place here. Uh, ideally, her campaign would have wanted her within five of Trump, maybe even on a fantastic night, having a chance of winning in Polk County. But those are it's a slight underperformance performance for her here in these suburban areas. And then the problem was the bottom just fell out for her in rural areas. Mm -hmm. There's more than 20 counties in the state where she finished in single digits tonight. There are only four counties where Ron DeSantis is going to finish in single digits. Really didn't show the expansion of a coalition uh, for Nikki Haley tonight in Iowa. Steve Karnacki, I know these are long nights for you, so thank you again for sticking up with all of us. I want to bring in NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns now, who's at Governor Ron DeSantis' headquarters in West Des Moines, Iowa. Dasha, tell us what's happening on the ground right now and how does the team feel? Well, look, as the party's winding down here, no doubt the entire team is breathing a sigh of relief. He did edge out Nikki Haley for second place, and this was do or die for the DeSantis campaign. They poured so many resources, so much energy into the state. And look, if you had created a rubric for how to run a campaign in Iowa, they really checked all the boxes. They got an A on it. I was in this state back in June when they were training door knockers. They knocked on nearly a million doors here. They got all of the right endorsements. Governor Kim Reynolds, evangelical leader Bob Van Der Plaats, uh, he spent more time here than any other candidate except Vivek Ramaswamy, of course, who dropped out tonight. Uh, but at the end of the day, that was kind of the big factor here. If he did all of that and he didn't come in second place, that was going to be a huge problem for him. So the fact that he made it to second place, he said tonight, you punched my card. I can now come out of Iowa and go on with the campaign here. But he's not heading to New Hampshire. Hampshire tomorrow. He's actually heading to South Carolina to stomp on Nikki Haley's home turf. The two of them are going to be going at it. But here's the thing. Iowa sets the narrative, right? That's why the state is so important. And the narrative that we got tonight is Donald Trump is absolutely dominant and the non-Trump vote is still very much split. It's not like DeSantis came out of this with a resounding second place win. It is, it is very close as far as we see it right now. I know we don't have the final margins yet, but it's very 
very close. Nikki Haley's going to dominate in New Hampshire, but then she's going to struggle in South Carolina. So as you look at the map going forward with the non-Trump vote, it's going to be really tough for, for anyone to catch uh, the former president. But his rivals do live to fight another day. For Ron DeSantis, living to fight another day. There we go. NBC's Dasha Burns, thank you so much for joining us early AM uh, that we are in. Um, I want to bring in now NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard, who is in Des Moines tonight at Donald Trump's Iowa headquarters. Von, what are you hearing there from the Trump team? Donald Trump is en route here now to New Hampshire. Look, this was the dominant win that he was looking for. And frankly, I, there was one notable figure that was up on that stage. Perhaps not, you know, very notable to much of the country, but a governor, North Dakota governor, Doug Burgum. He is the one Republican presidential candidate who took on Donald Trump, who, who, who appeared on the debate stage with him, dropped out, and then just this weekend endorsed him. Donald Trump, welcome to the stage. We didn't see Tim Scott. We didn't see Mike Pence up there. But it was Doug Burgum who so far is the one to have started the coalescing around Donald Trump. And frankly, it's notable because we have lived through this before. Eight years ago, I was here in the state of Iowa, and it was Ron DeSantis, or I should say Ted Cruz, who was making many of the same arguments that we've been hearing from Ron DeSantis, Jen, over the last couple of days. That that uh, Donald Trump is going to get creamed in a general election, that Fox News is not being fair. These are the types of arguments that we heard from Ted Cruz eight years ago. And yet, what have we seen already? We see Marco Rubio this weekend, just eight years after he was endorsed by Nikki Haley, not return the favor here in 2024, but instead endorse uh, Donald Trump here. And that is where it was back in Hialeah, the day of that Miami NBC debate. And I asked a campaign senior advisor, what is your message to Republicans who have not gotten on board with Donald Trump here at this point in the middle of his retribution tour? And that senior advisor told me, tick tock. And right now, what we are finding mm -hmm. after a win like this tonight is just how long will the rest of this Republican Party wait to coalesce, not around an anti-Trump candidate like Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis, but coalesce around the Donald Trump who could very well be on his way to this nomination. You can kind of hear that in some of his speech, the beginning part of his speech tonight, I should say. Went a little off the rails later. But Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much for joining us. And you've been working hard there in the freezing cold temperatures. Thanks for being with us uh, tonight. So I'm going to go to my panel um, and just get your thoughts. There's a lot to dig into. But I want to start just with, we heard from a lot of these candidates tonight since we've seen the results. I just mentioned Trump. Mm -hmm. He started out sort of restrained Trump, I'll call it, um, about everybody coalescing, coming together. Um, what did you make of his comments tonight or his speech? Hey, it, was, it was typical Trump in, in many respects, but I think Trump also recognizes a window in which um, he can put um, a lot more pressure on Nikki going into New Hampshire uh, than, than she may realize. Mm -hmm. uh, because the idea uh, among the rank and file of the party is, okay, everybody needs to get on board behind Trump. Vivek come out, he gets out, he endorses Trump. Burgum endorses Trump. Burgum, he's, he's really having a moment. He's having a moment. Year. You have you have these, but you have others inside the party itself, uh, officials inside the party, making that move towards Trump. Mm -hmm. So it's going to put a lot of pressure on New Hampshire. New Hampshire has always been in certainly in Republican. Uh, primary circles, that outlier state, because Democrats and independents get to play mm -hmm. and have a say in who the nominee is. In any other election cycle, that's good for a John McCain. That's good for, you know, a George Bush. In this election cycle, it doesn't play the same mm -hmm. way. If you're not on board going into New Hampshire, you're not going to be the person that's going to pull that party away from Trump mm -hmm. onto you when you get to South Carolina, your home state, and elsewhere. So it creates, a, I think, a, an interesting pressure point for Nikki in how she plays to that Democrat independent base that she's going to need to push her numbers up to t overtake Trump. And at the same time, not lose that Trump, that Trump base. Yeah, I mean, New Hampshire is such a different electorate than Iowa and different from a lot of the other states. We also saw Nikki Haley speak. Um, we, it gave us a little bit of a sense of how she's going to maybe play the next couple of days. What did you make of her remarks? I think she's, she wants to fight. She made a compelling case, uh, at least to New Hampshire voters, mm -hmm. um, and laid it on argument against Trump. 
uh, both on sort of character grounds but electability grounds. Uh, you know, kind of couched it as going after both Trump and Biden, but making that generational case. And so I think that's the question. Listen, if, if she can't win New Hampshire, what, next Tuesday's January 23rd, the Republican primary is over. The general election, like if I were Trump, I would declare it over. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go to any more primary states, yeah. and I'd start the general election committee. Yeah. If Haley wins, then you probably go through March. And then her challenge is to figure out, and I think it's a steep challenge, how can you eat into some of those traditional Republican voters? Uh, and maybe that takes really bad polls where she's beating Biden by 10, and there's a lot of them, and Trump's losing by 10. I don't think that's enough. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what we're down to right now. I think DeSantis had a shot. He didn't take advantage of it. We heard all the money all the time, and he got 21% of the vote. He's not going to have that anywhere else. So it'll be, I don't know why he's going to stay, and I'm sure he will. Maybe thinking Haley loses. Because he gave loses. license to stay, maybe. If he'd gotten third, it would have been harder. Well, but there's, no, there's nowhere to go. Right. You know, when I grew up in campaigns, you got to win. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, if you can't win, and he, there's no state that I think this guy can win, including his home state. So I think that's where. But Haley, I was impressed that she, she made a case. Uh, it was probably the strongest case I've heard her make. Because I think that, and, and I agree with you, Trump's going to be waiting there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is a brutal week in American politics. Uh, and so we'll see how she can handle the spotlight. But if, if she's able to win, her path could not be more narrow at that point, but at least she has one. I think that's where we are. He's already mm. kind of previewed Simone. I mean, he sort of <laughs> alluded in this very mobby Trump way to, you'll learn something about Nikki Haley in the days ahead. That was even before tonight. But if you, okay, you've advised a lot of candidates. If you were advising her, would you be participating in this debate on Thursday? Uh, yes, I would, but also we would have gotten a new speechwriter for tonight. Because <laughs> let me tell you, Nikki Haley came all, out of the Give us your tonight. line edits. I was like, what is going edits. on? Who edited this? She comes out and she sounded like a pundit. When she's talking about 70% of Americans process. don't want too much process. Yeah. What Americans Good want, point. they want some inspiration. Mm -hmm. e Republican voters who aren't really feeling Donald Trump but may still like his policies, you got to give them something to vote for. And w what Nikki Haley said, you could turn on the television and hear us say it better right now. So I, I just, I think that she, she has to turn the page from being a pundit and get a little bit more inspirational. And the debate will give her the opportunity to do that. It's going to be the biggest stage she's going to stand on before it's just the Santos, yes, right? yes, it's just hurting. Well, if he's if he's still standing there, and I do think he will be standing there to Davis point because there's no, I mean, had he came in third, I think I would be on DeSantis dropout watch. But he came in second, and this is his opportunity. I think that at the end of the day, you win a primary by delegates, and Donald Trump is the one that came out of Iowa with the most delegates. There are delegates to be got in New Hampshire. Uh, there are some delegates in Nevada. Nikki Haley will not be able to gather any of those delegates because she's not participating in the party-run mm -hmm. caucus and that state. She's only going to participate in the primary. There will be no delegates awarded there. And she is not poised to win her home state. There has not been a Republican nominee and only two presidents in our modern day history have lost their home state and gone on to win the presidency. Five total. I the math is not math. It's certainly a hard speech to write if you lose your home state. One of the things I think is challenging, Alicia, with Haley is kind of how she runs against Trump. I mean, first of all, he's already tried to birth her. That's mm -hmm. only going to get worse, and he's going to come after her with everything he's got. Um, we're going to let me let us play if we if we have it. This um, her in her caucus night speech today, where she talks about Trump. She's made the same argument again and again about how she supported him in the past, and then we talk about it. Do we have it? Okay, so we'll, we'll get I'm it up. Familiar, Alicia. I'm familiar with the sound. And what it underscores to me is just how unusual this moment is, right? Because I think sometimes you hear the campaign election music swell and you see their headshots pop up and you see Steve Kornacki at the big board. And it's really easy to forget what it is we are talking about here. We are talking about the fact that Republicans are prepared to put forward as their nominee a twice uh, four times indicted, twice impeached former president who has no real winning record, right? He has lost the popular vote twice. He lost the Electoral College once. He lost the Iowa caucuses, despite the fact that tonight on stage he tried to claim having won all three of them. He endorses right, candidates. Ted Cruz stole them. And they lose that was right. this argument so, years ago. So, so, to so, me, the, so to me, the biggest <laughs> tell is, well, because, because we always sit here and we say, why? No, How? No, 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 How no, is no, it no. possible? Why would all of these folks be coming out in sub-zero temperatures to support right. someone who they are not certain can win in a general election? 
election. And the fact that you had in these entrance polls, two thirds of these caucus goers saying that they do not believe that Joe Biden, the current president of the United States, is a legitimately elected president, helps explain why they don't think Donald Trump's a loser. Because they have bought his lie that he did not lose. Okay, hold your thought, because I know it's no, a good No, 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 I wasn't, actually, to be clear, I was, I was trying to be ironic and, and kind no, of No, you're a backup singer, I love it. I'm trying to I'm a, sing, I'm a backup singer. Today, I saw, so, yeah. but I, you also, I feel do like... Do I, do I? No, <laughs> okay. it was... We, but you're going to have a good point. We do have to sneak in a quick break, but we have so much more to talk about, clearly, because Michael Steele is, like, chomping. He's ready to say <laughs> something. We'll be right back. Stay with us. So Donald Trump has handily won the Iowa caucuses tonight. Ron DeSantis eked out a second place finish tonight over Nikki Haley, giving him a sliver of a rationale for staying in this race. And yet Nikki Haley said tonight that Iowa turned this into a two-person race. Tonight, Iowa made this Republican primary a two-person race. <laughs> Tonight, tonight, I will be back in the great state of New Hampshire. And the question before Americans is now very clear. Do you want more of the same? No. Or do you want a new generation of conservative leadership? We're back with our panel. Okay, people in the room really liked her speech. I'm not sure how she squares the two-person race argument. I mean, Ron DeSantis, I think we may all agree, doesn't exactly have a path forward, but he did beat her. But he'll be in New Hampshire, so it's a three-person race. Still is, yeah. right? This math is math. Is Hutchinson still in the race as well? Yeah, so it's a four-person race. Maybe. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Simone's point about reevaluating the speechwriter, who clearly did not do last-minute edits on that right, speech. Exactly. That was a speech that was written as though it was intended to be given after as, she placed well, it. Or after she's after she hoping people second. aren't really following the Steve Karnacki big board, mm -hmm. and she just wants to tell people how she did. And look, I have the, all of the momentum look, going. Yeah, I think the factor still remains, and it, this is Trump's dance. He 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 paid for the orchestra. He paid for the balloons and the confetti. He paid for the dance hall. I mean, it's his dance. So you can come in and you think you can, you know, whirl around the room and take out. It's not how it's going to work. I have one edit. He likely didn't pay for any of it, but he's yeah, that's that true. The bill he was did. Paid. Someone else paid for it. But, but I let, agree let me, with the let me, point. Let me finish the point real quick. The, the point is just simply this. I understand a lot of there's a lot of momentum and energy that want to push Nikki over the over the line in New Hampshire, uh, regardless of whatever happened in Iowa. At the end of the day, I just don't see those numbers, and I don't see that energy in that base for that. And depend, independent and Democratic voters are not going to be enough in a Republican primary to overcome Trump in another primary with a different Republican, maybe. I just, I think they're shortchanging that Trump turnout machine. I mean, in look, the, in she, she also, let's be clear, did not have a good night tonight. I mean, she had a poll that showed her for the first time in second place just a few days ago. It's not that her numbers were so off from there, and the electorate, obviously, you got to make a bet about that. Right. But Ron DeSantis beat her. She was pretending he was barely in the race as of a couple days ago. I have no problem with what she said. Because in reality, it is a two-person race. Because, yeah, she did not meet the expectations of the last couple weeks. Right? But she just needed to do what she did because DeSantis has nothing after this. He put all of his chips into Iowa. That's what we did in 2008. Mm -hmm. It's what candidates have done historically since the. And if you, if you put all your chips there to not come in second to win and you don't, you're out. And, and DeSantis just doesn't have any realistic path. So it might not have been polite for her to say <laughs> that, but that's the reality. And the entire world's going to be focused on New Hampshire in the next eight days. It's going to be a Trump. Haley discussion, DeSantis won't even be part of it. So the only way that it's DeSantis is in the picture would be, let's say Haley loses by 10 or 15 next week. Mm -hmm. I don't think she would, but decides like I'm out. 
and then DeSantis is left standing to like lose 70-30 everywhere, mm -hmm. if not 80-20. So it is a two-person race in that. By the way, she's got like a 2% chance. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but th those are the only two people I think you could credibly say have a chance. And for her, like, it's got to be an amazing black swan event, starting with she has to win next week. A black week. swan event. I love well, that Well, it's term. what Trump had in 16, quite frankly. Right. Okay? They happen very rarely, but they happen in politics. I don't see this. I mean, his numbers are so strong. And if you look at even the Illinois and the Californias yeah. and the Marylands of and the, the world, Marylanders, yeah. Trump is, is a dominant, dominant front runner, even if Haley wins next mm, week. And yeah. California matters. That's the biggest get yeah. for delegates on Super Tuesday. The chairman made a point in the break that I, that I think people should hear. And the question is, where do Chris Christie's voters go? And if you look back at the speech that the former governor of New Jersey gave when he suspended his campaign, he very clearly and um, bold and underlined it did not endorse any of his former opponents in this race. He noted that anyone who is unwilling to say that Donald Trump is unfit to be president is unfit to be president themselves. All of the people left in this race have been unwilling to say that. And by Chris Christie's own standard, he was telling his voters that none of these people deserve your votes. I think he was making a general election argument, but he was speaking to those people that were with them in with him in that room. Yes, there were some in Democrats in that room. There were lots of independents and there were real Republicans in that room, and it was full. I, I just do not think Nikki Haley is up to the task because if you want to win, you got to compete. And this, honey, has not been a competition. <laughs> to that point, we, we do have have the sound I mentioned earlier of Haley talking about Trump and how she formerly worked for him. This is such a tricky little word salad she's got going on, but let, let's listen to that and we'll talk about it. I've spoken a lot of hard truths to America, and here's another one. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve in his administration, but when I say more of the same, you know what I'm talking about. It's both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Trump and Biden both lack a vision for our country's future because both are consumed by the past, by investigations, by vendettas, by grievances. America deserves better. So I do think, one, she's a good speaker, she's a good debater, the contrast in terms of next generation is very good and effective, I think. Mm -hmm. What feels tricky to me is if it becomes a two-person race is she's running against Trump and saying, I worked for him, I voted for him twice, he was the right president then, but he's not the right president now. It feels a little... It's the type of word salad that only very expensive polling can buy, right? You could hear her sort of hitting a bunch of marks <laughs> of things so that her consultants yeah. have told her can actually, like, the one path she has. Um, I think what she is trying to do, if I can dissect that word salad, is to, is to create what we often talk about, which is a permission structure for Trump voters to say, not this time, right? right. She, she's come not, my way. Come I'm my young. Way. I'm I, next gen. But not even just that. Saying, I too voted for him. I too saw the appeal, right? Because we 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 think a lot about these folks who, who maybe feel that they were duped, but they don't want to admit that they were duped, and they don't know how to come back from that. Or, or folks who maybe still like him, but aren't sure that he can be elected. So saying almost, I am one of you. I too voted for him, but I am ready to make a pivot. Are you ready to make a pivot with me? I think that is what she is attempting to do, but I think what we saw in Iowa tonight is there are not necessarily enough Republican voters who are willing in a primary that's to make that point. pivot with. She should say what you point. just said, because that's better. That was speech actually traders. better. That they're, was actually better. They're not available to be hired as speech writers because you have a new <laughs> show called The Weekend that's on Saturdays and Sundays. But otherwise, you're giving free advice here on MSNBC. If you're watching, Nikki Haley and your team, Simone Sanders Townsend, Alicia Menendez, thank you for staying up with us tonight. Pluff and Steel, you aren't going anywhere. You get the good straw tonight. <laughs> Tim Miller and Jennifer Palmieri are standing by. We have so much more to get to, including much more in the state of the race in New Hampshire. We're back after a very quick break.
With the results from Iowa in, the Republican candidates are on the move to their next destinations. For Nikki Haley, it's straight to New Hampshire. She better be holding some sort of rally there when she arrives. Donald Trump is headed to New York tonight, obviously, where he will be attending the start of a new civil trial brought against him by E. Jean Carroll, before then heading to New Hampshire for a rally later in the evening. And for Ron DeSantis, it's South Carolina. DeSantis is bucking usual political tradition to attend an event a state that won't be holding its primary for another month. Now, after Donald Trump's victory tonight, New Hampshire will be one of the few last best chances for someone to build any sort of momentum and actually challenge the heavy Republican favorite. Whether there's any reality to that is a big question, not really a question. But, and the candidate best place to do that, if someone is going to do it, is Haley. She's the endorsement of New Hampshire Governor Kristen Nunu, and over the past week, she has managed to close the polling gap between her and Donald Trump. David Pluff and Michael Steele are still here with me and joining the conversation. Some fresh blood, former communications director for Jeb Bush, uh, Bush's 2016 campaign, now writer at large for The Bulwark, Tim Miller, and former communications director for President Barack Obama, Jennifer Palmieri. Jen is also the host of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024. Okay, fresh blood here. Uh, Tim Miller, I know you've got some thoughts, some rants here on what's going to happen in New Hampshire. What does it look like for Nikki Haley there? Does this have any impact? Yeah. Uh, this is a profoundly depressing night. I would just like to start with that. <laughs> like, Donald Trump <laughs> attempted a coup three years ago, and he is on a glide path to the biggest blowout in any presidential contest and in any of our adult lives. That even includes Chairman Steele. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, right. Like, that's what's happening right now. Yeah. And, and Nikki Haley, it feels like it's a show campaign that is happening that's going on for, from here. We have to go through the motions. I'll send a Jen. It's like, it feels like this is Belarus or something where Lukashenko puts up two other candidates just to have on the ballot at this point. I mean, Nikki, they lost, Nikki lost by 32 points tonight. Yeah. Like the biggest blowout before this in Iowa caucus history was 12 points. Uh, not What's going to happen in New Hampshire? Democrats she, are going to save her? She, she won Johnson County, one county, which is by like... By one vote. Which is, yeah, by one vote, which is like the Brooklyn or, or Boulder of Iowa, um, <laughs> <laughs> to, name, to name what it is. Uh, it's where Iowa City is, in the University of Iowa. Uh, and she didn't make up any ground among a, any coalition that's beyond Democrats, no. never-Trumpers, independents. Like suburban no. Republican yeah. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Types. In fact, law square. In fact, lo in fact, lost ground. Because right, because Chairman Steele predicted that she would come in third, that she would she would not come in second. But she is. I'm like, never talking about this. It's like she's like a television character of a presidential candidate, but she doesn't actually like go for the gusto, right? She doesn't. I don't feel like she really has. The, if she really had the fire in her, she would be making the like. She would be going directly at Trump, not trying to have a metaphor of like Trump and Biden are the same, are the same people. Still. She may win in New Hampshire because New Hampshire really does not like Trump. I mean, at, if you look at the general election polling, Biden's doing really well there. There's been a lot of anti-Trump messaging. They really don't like him. Democrats and independents, maybe they could save her. New Hampshire, for their own status, they need to do something to prove they're relevant. So maybe they want to do it. I think Michael's right, though, because I have been to Trump rallies in New Hampshire. Yeah. There are a lot of bodies that um, show up. So it is, it's possible that there's a, you know, that that's not really reflected in the, um, in the polling. But I think that New Hampshire is going to want this to be a, a fight. They're going to they're gonna want to do something different than what Iowa did. That's what they always do. Isn't that right, David Fluff? Historically, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, listen, she's holding a weak hand. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. But she was the only one with cards at the table other than Trump. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know. Does I she think have cards after New Hampshire, though? No, if she doesn't win next week, it's over. Donald Trump's the nominee. But even if she wins New Hampshire? Uh, after that, it's like perilous territory, like because there's no state like New Hampshire the rest of the way. So I think that's probably the highlight. And then she gets drilled in her home state, and mm -hmm. she loses badly on Super Tuesday. But at least she lives to fight another day and see how Trump deals with the lost. He won't deal with it well. Uh, but listen, <laughs> no. let's get down to math. I mean... You know, for her to win New Hampshire, maybe you end up still getting six to eight percent. Other candidates, DeSantis gets some. So, you know, could she get 44 to 46 percent of the vote? Maybe. She can't get 50. 
So I think it'll be close. I mean, but this week matters too. New, this is like an hour to hour thing in New Hampshire, having been through it totally. <laughs> before. And so it's also how she performs. And the spotlight's not always been her friend. Mm -hmm. And Trump's going to lay a bunch of landmines for her. There's no question about that. So, so yes, it's the gift if she wins New Hampshire is you're probably going to get clobbered everywhere else. That's what we're looking at. But if she doesn't win New Hampshire, if I were Donald Trump next week, he's clearly eager for the primary to be over, and it will be over. And if I were him, I wouldn't go to a single other primary state, just say I'm running against Joe Biden, and I'll be in Wisconsin tomorrow and Arizona the day after that, and it's on. Whatever DeSantis and Nikki do, they'll be like spectral figures running around the country that no one cares so about. So I will say, it's, he was pretty low energy tonight. He didn't look like oh, a guy that was about just, to fly around was, to Wisconsin yeah, or yeah, Pennsylvania. He was like the Fox News town hall of last week energy, though, the, yeah. which maybe was strategic. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, he might just be tired. He's getting he, he, up there. I think, I think age is caught up with him. Uh, the, the reality, though, I mean, to David's point, what's the point? I mean, it, it, this is a presidential... Well, you're not as bullish as Nikki Haley winning New Hampshire as others. I think no, it's fair I, to say. I think Donald Trump wins it. I think, in fact, I think Donald Trump gets close to 50% of the vote in New Hampshire. Uh, and, and I think people just need to be realistic about whose party this is. You, you, people want to run a, a, a race that doesn't exist. And you just need to stop it and, and recognize the facts. I mean, I don't know. What do I know? I was a county chairman, a state chairman, a national chairman. I think I know a little bit about how the party works internally. And the party has and who changed the base a lot is. since and that time. And the party time. has changed a lot. I've watched it change on my watch. I've been a part of it. I've been in that room. I know these folks. I know them well. And they are committed. And they're committed to the guy who is right now sitting here with over 50% coming out of Iowa, going into New Hampshire. How much steam do you think he loses when he gets to New Hampshire? How much steam do you think he loses when he gets to South Carolina and Nevada? And if he thinks he's losing steam, he's going to birth her more. So I think we can all prepare yeah, ourselves I mean, for I that. Think we just need to be realistic about what we're talking about here. I mean, I get everybody wants to put this in the, in the traditional presidential race box and there's this has not been a traditional presidential race since 2016 and we need to stop looking at it that way and understand that the guy who represents an existential threat to this country to your point is about to become the nominee of my party that concerns me and i don't see nikki haley i don't see anybody else stopping that from happening we're and, gonna and dig into all the entry polls. Hold your thought, because we're gonna come back after a very, very quick now break. We gotta sneak soda. it in. Um, <laughs> everyone is sticking around. We're gonna keep digging into the numbers, including the entry polls, which which do display a lot of what you're talking about. So everyone stick with us, we'll be right back. Donald Trump's victory in Iowa tonight was thanks in large part to some key demographic groups that make up the MAGA base, no surprise. That includes white evangelical Christians who didn't exactly love him back in 2016, but they represented more than half of the total electorate tonight. Trump won 53% of that group. Likewise, more than half of all caucus scores described themselves as very conservative. And among them, 61% voted for Trump. So given those numbers, it's not that surprising that Trump won by such a wide margin tonight. What's more surprising is that Trump also edged out his Republican rivals among caucus goers with a college degree. And he also won among caucus goers who identified as independents. And while Nikki Haley has emphasized her electability as a big selling point, electability turned out, at least in these entry polls, to be a fairly low priority issue for caucus goers. 41% of caucus goers said that a candidate that, quote, shares their values was the most important quality in deciding who they would support. Well, just 14% said that a candidate's ability to win in November mattered most to them. I don't, these are imperfect entry polls, and polls are generally imperfect. But some of this stuff is still pretty interesting including some statistics I mentioned earlier, or, or entry poll numbers, which is that about two-thirds of caucus goers don't think Joe Biden was elected president, as the duly elected president, and about two-thirds of them would be fine if Trump was a convicted felon. So those were the ones that stuck out to me uh, as well. But what did we learn? Did we learn anything about demographics in Iowa? Anything that surprised you about any of those numbers? Well, the, 
the folks not believing Biden's legitimate, I'm surprised it's that low. I thought it'd be higher. It's what they hear every day. Who's the other third? Maybe, yeah, maybe right. they're people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm surprised it wasn't like 80. But I think what we see is just that his support is deep. It's geographic. It's demographic. It's education. It's income. It's ideology. So New Hampshire is the one place where maybe that could get upset a little bit just because of the nature of the electorate there. Uh, and that you are going to have, particularly because there's no Democratic contest, a lot of independents and Democrats participate. But as you go deeper into the calendar, it just shows um, he's almost unassailable. It's hard to see a weakness there. So you would think in most states, Trump should be favored to do what he did in Iowa tonight. I mean, one of the questions, the evangelical support there, first of all, what it means to be an evangelical is like another question I hope somebody writes another big story about. But evangelicals, I mean, they didn't change, Trump didn't change to shape himself to them. They essentially shaped, changed to shape themselves to him. Right, and the path to beating Trump back in 16 was you want to get the most devout evangelicals, right, because they were suspect of him. And then you want to add on top of that, you know, some of my people, right, the moderate, suburban, Republican types, and hopefully you could put together a coalition. That was the theory of the case for Rubio. But uh, this thing's, that's all gotten a lot worse since then, right, because the evangelicals have clearly, as we saw tonight in Iowa, when Trump wins northwest Iowa, the most evangelical part of the country outside the Deep South, overwhelmingly right and with no competition so that coalition within the republican party is gone now and you cannot win a republican primary with just that latter half the suburban republicans and even in that coalition trump wins i mean look at the county data you know it says he's winning in college educated but even if you don't trust the entrance polls you can't trust the raw data he won polk county where des moines is he won dallas county which is the suburbs mm -hmm. of des moines where democrats have kind of done better recently where there was recently a shooting by the way where trump said let's move forward and people supported him there. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the fundamental truth has been this whole primary is that Republicans are not looking for an alternative to Donald Trump, you know, and they, they um, and other, it's very unusual for someone who's been in the office before to run again. So he's basically an incumbent running. And if 50, you know, it's always, it's been the case since, um, you know, DeSantis had that window early on in November of 22, but since that time, it's been the case that Trump has had a majority of the party, and you can't win without his supporters, and there's just never been, no one's ever been art to articulate a reason to have people come their way without losing. They also didn't really try. Doesn't. They, noted, they didn't really try. Yeah, it's hard. not. There's, this is not like a stellar group of. This is not. There's not like. Wow, what a really great right. natural really athlete that we have. <laughs> right. We have like it's not, not a superstar <laughs> set of candidates. It's a very cultural though, which is my other takeaway of this. We we do have to sneak in a very quick break. Everyone is staying put because we've got a whole other full hour of special coverage coming up. Results in Iowa, predictions for New Hampshire and beyond. Lots of caffeine. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's 1 a.m. here in New York, midnight in Iowa, and the very first test of the 2024 Republican primary season is now complete. Joining me now at the top of this hour is former Obama campaign manager, MSNBC political analyst, and my former boss, David Pluff, former RNC chairman and co-host of The Weekend, Michael Steele, former communications director for Jeb Bush's 2016 campaign, and now writer at large for The Bulwark, Tim Miller, and former communications director for President Barack Obama, Jennifer Palmieri. Now, tonight in Iowa, NBC News projected that Donald Trump won the caucuses with more than 50 percent of the vote. These numbers really cement the four times indicted defendant candidate status as the front runner. We already knew this, but as the in the Republican field, the race for second place had a little bit more drama with Nikki Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis locked in a dead heat for most of the night. But as awkward as he may be at times, and he is awkward, DeSantis did put in the work in Iowa, and maybe that helped him. He, he visited all 99 can, uh, counties, and it paid off a bit with a second-place finish in the state, even if he doesn't have a real path forward, it seems. Third-place finisher Nikki Haley is now off to New Hampshire, where traditionally presidential candidates go right after the Iowa caucuses. But not Donald Trump. He will once again buck tradition and head to a courtroom in New York City for the start of the E. Jean Carroll defamation trial. 
And that civil case is, of course, on top of the four criminal trials that Trump is also facing, where he also seems to want to appear in the courtrooms, involving his hoarding of classified information and attempts to overturn the last election. Just to name a few. But Trump's legal woes certainly didn't hold him back tonight. As we were just talking about, about two-thirds of Iowa caucus goers say that even if he's convicted, they still consider him to fit, fit to be president. So this slice of the Republican electorate seems pretty clear who their first choice is, criminal charges and all. Uh, back with me with, uh, is, is my all-star panel here. So we've talked a lot about Trump. We've talked a lot about the Republican candidates. Let's talk a little bit about the other guy running, uh, President Joe Biden. So, Pluff, you talk to the campaign a lot. If they're watching what happened tonight, what do they think of it? Do they think about it? Well, one thing that's important when you're incumbent is when does the general election start? And so this would suggest it's going to start a lot sooner than you'd probably like. Is that good for them? Um, I would argue maybe it is, just because the sooner this turns into a searing contrast, probably the better off Biden is. So even if you'd probably like a couple more months to prepare, I think being in that boxing ring with him and him alone is probably helpful. Um, and I think what it shows is, you know, the Republican Party is, my guess is the biggest concern I have as I think about next November is the turnout differential that could be there. You know, there's not the enthusiasm for Biden that you'd like. Maybe they can run into that. I think Trump's going to get his turnout. There's clearly some disaffected Republicans that may sit it out, or maybe Biden mm -hmm. could do as well as him he did in, in 20, and that was important. But I think Trump's going to get his turnout. I would argue if he gets convicted, even more so. So I think these numbers show whatever you think it's going to take to win a state like Wisconsin or Arizona, if I'm the Biden campaign, I add 10 percent to it. It's basically a tax mm -hmm. that the Trump turnout's going to be there. But that's the big thing is starting next Tuesday, if Haley doesn't win New Hampshire, Trump's speech is going to be, I'm done with the primary. I've dispatched with all these second-rate losers. <laughs> and it's time for the rematch. Yep. And it's going to be right on your doorstep, whether you like it or not. I agree. They, the Biden campaign is fundraising off of Trump's front-runner yeah. status tonight. They don't really utter the names Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis because none of them think that they're going to be running against them. They do have this interesting challenge, uh, which you've talked about on the Republican side, too, where there's this belief from a fair number of undecided voters that it's not going to be Trump-Biden, right? That it won't be Trump on the other side, which, to Pluff's point, if this is clear that it's Trump to everyone, they are helped by that. But what, what, would you, what do you think they should be doing to make that more clear? The Biden people? Yeah. I agree with everything David said. I, I think I think if I advising the president's campaign right now, I'd look at them and say, can you, can you put our boy on the street? Can you just have him walk some neighborhoods? Have him go sit on, you know. Some, As in President Biden. Uh, President Biden, yeah. Our boy. Our guy. boy, yeah. yeah. Just to be clear, which is fine. <laughs> I don't give a minute like, who's the boy? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But, but, that, but see, but that's my point. You got to bring it to that level so that people understand he's my boy. They got to connect with this guy, and he is connectable. And Democrats overthink the proposition here. Mm -hmm. This is not a complicated scenario against Donald Trump. It is a very complicated scenario against Nikki Haley. And so you need to understand the, the runway you're being given. So let Donald Trump shorten that, try to shorten that runway by coming out of New Hampshire saying, OK, let's do it. I'm ready. I'm ready, too. Where do you want to meet so I can talk about your 91 and, you know, indictments? So I can talk about your, your uh, E.G. Carroll problem. And I can talk about the money you have to pay out. Oh, are your, are your donors still paying your legal bills? I mean, this is the level that the campaign has to be prepared to go. And if you don't really want to see your boy get into that space, meaning the president, okay, then the political operation around him has to go there. And they haven't yet. And that, to me, is stunning. I mean, I, I do think that your boy, President <laughs> Joe Biden, um, you know, going into communities is actually, to your point, what his superpower is, right? I mean, right. He, he loves, he's, he's kind of um, more extroverted than almost anyone I've met. I mean, it's downright exhausting, actually. Um, but he loves that glad handing and all of that stuff. It's often blamed on the communication strategy, which we all know is like never the totality <laughs> is that, is that of the issue. 
it's spot true. for you. I know, <laughs> it's like, I'm feeling I'm getting shakes, I'm sure. We, I used to have mugs, I said, would say we'd make mugs that say, not, not a comms problem, because sometimes it's just often a problem, but not a comms problem. problem. But, but <laughs> talk to me, both of you, whoever wants to start, a little bit about, we know what Joe Biden's superpowers are, right? He's empathetic, he connects with people, he loves, you know, yes. glad handing. Um, he did give two good speeches, but that's not his superpower. It's not even really how people are voting. So what, what should they so be doing? I think that, first, I would say, I, I do think that the, I, I know the Biden campaign is like, this is going to be the earliest general election we've ever had. Yeah. They, they are prepared for that. It started on January 5th with that speech that he gave in Valley Forge. And I think, and you know, they are making a ton of hires. They have their hires for the battleground. People were in the battlegrounds in January, right? Like normally you're hoping to get people there May, June, yeah. July. Like they are actually on it. And he did, you know, last week he did, he did Valley Forge. He went to South Carolina. The vice president has been in all the early primary states. He went to, um, he went back to Pennsylvania later in the week. He's going to go to Michigan. He's going to Nevada. He is, and, and in making these speeches, they're doing the big contrast mm -hmm. with Trump, you know, on democracy and freedoms and all that things that are at stake. They're also, if you look at what he says, but then also what they're doing online, and I know you saw this when you went to yeah. Wilmington, Jen, that very targeted communication around accomplishments for African-American voters, accomplishments for Hispanic voters, the voters they had in 20 that they have to win back. So they are, it's not like, oh, they're asleep at the switch. They, like, they, are, they are on it in terms of actually now implementing plans. I think that, and you know, because we've been causing trouble in the back all night talking, <laughs> rah, 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 rah. why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? More of this. And we're all in agreement that we need to see more of Joe Biden. Yeah. And, you know, even though he's older and, you know, and, and he, can, he can misspeak, let us see that, let us be accustomed to it, and let us see what we love about the guy, too, yeah. you know? And if you want to put a pit dog on television, Mitch Landrew is going over to the campaign, and yeah. that guy, I know. Is, uh, he is an amazing communicator. He's a pit bull dog, yeah. yes, but he's also a po political politico. He also loves to glad hand, and he also talks it. like a both normal both human things. being. It, to, to Palmieri's point, uh, I did spend some time with the campaign, and one of the things, obviously have to meet people where they are, an overused term, but they're very focused on that. A lot of what they're happening is a little behind the scenes. It's like hard to break through the blocking out of the sun of Donald Trump and the crazy stuff he says and all of his legal issues. So a lot of what they're doing online is private, it's targeted, but I mean, Tim, w you and I have talked often about how you wish. It's so funny. I just want Tim, more. Tim wants more, but Tim also <laughs> always asks me, why can't the Democratic Party just sing off the same song sheet? Uh, just no. once. Okay. I, wait, oh my gosh, it's just not once. a monolithic party Please. like the Republican well, just Party. Give me more we'll put the lyrics in bigger letters for you if you need, <laughs> okay. but please. Give me but more we'll... of Biden and give me more of Biden's people out there. I do, I do need more. I need yeah. more Biden surrogates. I need more Biden. We don't need to treat him like fine China. I, right. I do want to see him out there. I, I, I want to go back to one other thing though to what David said. I think there might have been maybe some good news for Biden though mm -hmm. in the numbers tonight. Um, I agree that in general Trump will get his people out. But this caucus turnout wasn't anything. No, it was actually small. Yeah. Even after all down. of the Iowans were saying, yeah. we're fine, we're going to yeah. put on socks so and maybe go out that's in the cold. The weather. <laughs> maybe that's the fact that it's a blowout. But I think it's just something to keep an eye on. 167,000 last time. Uh, it looks like we're at 120 something right now. So a big downtick from 2016. The other thing is what's this number? Now, 32% if Trump is convicted is unfit to be president. That's a big number, even if that's off, even if it's 22%. And even if he's not convicted, yeah. that's a group of people for the Biden campaign yeah. to work from. Like they can speak to those people and they can persuade those people. And that is a persuadable audience. Uh, the, the folks that went out there to vote for Nikki Haley today, it, it seems like most of them are pretty sick of Donald Trump um, in a way that, you know, getting almost a Tim Miller and Michael Steele. Terry. I don't know if they're ready to call Joe Biden their boy yet, but they seem pretty <laughs> sick of Donald Trump. And so I think that was also encouraging and is like another, you know, big fat ball coming down the middle of the plate for the Biden yeah, campaign and if they can hit can, can I just add one more yeah, number to, to back up what Tim's saying? One other important number that's in the buried in here uh, for the Biden campaign, which is good. Of the Republican caucus goers, 11 percent, 11 percent of them said if it's a Biden uh, Trump uh, November, they're going with they'll vote for Biden. So to to really emphasize the point mm -hmm. that Tim made, there's a lot in this mix in a state like Iowa mm -hmm. that's good for Democrats to take out of Iowa as they begin to put in place that advance on the on the. Uh, the and a third election. were against an abortion ban, which. 
No, there's a lot of material there. And of course, in the actual battleground states, which sadly Iowa is not anymore, <laughs> right. you know, we live in a sophisticated data world. So the Biden campaign will have a pretty good sense of who those actual voters are. And just, you know, presidential campaign can seem overwhelming, but it's actually quite simple. In this, in this election, it's like seven states. That's all it is. It's not 50. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not four, Iowa, four to five so percent uh, of actual swing voters. That's it. Small number of Americans. And it's a fairly small number of people that you're trying to get to turn out. You're not sure it's going to turn out. So I think in these numbers with the swing voters, I think there's a lot to be encouraged mm -hmm. by. But, but I think for Biden to win, you've got to make sure that you do both sides of it. That you, you, you reach your turnout goals, and you may be right. My suspicion has all been wrong. If, if the, the call to Republicans to restore the wrongfully you know, terminated leader uh, is going to be pretty strong. And I always think in campaigns it's always better, even if your data says they're going to get 10 votes in a precinct, assume they're going to get 12. Mm. Like, you got to raise your numbers. But I do think with swing voters, and the 11% number, I hadn't seen that. You mm -hmm. said these are hardcore, mostly evangelical Iowa Cox attenders saying that, mm -hmm. not general election Republicans. That would suggest that maybe there's up to 15, 18%. He won't get them all. Mm -hmm. But boy, if, you, if Biden could end up getting 6 to 8%, you know, that's how he it's gets to 270 changer. again. Yeah. yeah, it's a game changer. Uh, this is all very interesting and gives us a little hope. We need a little hope yeah. moment <laughs> out, out of tonight. We have so much more to get to this hour, including a live late night report from Manchester, New Hampshire, where the political circus is headed. We're back after a quick break. After Donald Trump's landslide win in Iowa, the eyes of the political world now turn to New Hampshire. Over the past weeks, Nikki Haley has managed to close the polling gap between her and Donald Trump, meaning that unlike Iowa, the primary there has a chance to actually be competitive. And if she does win, which Michael Steele's not too hot on, but we're still <laughs> going to talk about it, it could at least make for an interesting few weeks before South Carolina. Joining me now from Manchester, New Hampshire, is MSNBC correspondent Shaq Brewster. Shaq, we know Donald Trump is planning to head there after the first day of his defamation trial tomorrow night. Nikki Haley's on her way. Ron DeSantis is headed to South Carolina first. Tell us what you're hearing. Who, is Nikki Haley going to have an event when she lands, or what are you hearing about her plans for tomorrow? Yeah, she'll have an event uh, later in the afternoon, and you'll see events from all of the major candidates here in New Hampshire. Look, voters are ready for the attention to shift toward them. I'll tell you, I've talked to a lot of voters uh, throughout the course of the day. They're ready to go to these town halls. They're ready to engage with these candidates. When these candidates arrive in New Hampshire, they're arriving in a state that's going to have a different process and a different electorate. All that excitement that we saw out of Iowa with the correspondents walking through the auditoriums and the gymnasiums and hearing the candidates speeches in the open counting that all goes away when you get to New Hampshire this is mm -hmm. a standard primary it's more of what most people do when they go and vote polls will open sometime around 6 a.m. or as early as 6 a.m. they close at 7 p.m. and more it's more accessible to people you go in cash your ballot and walk out and those voters that are doing that it's a different electorate a much different group of voters than what we saw out of Iowa less conservative voters fewer evangelical voters many more moderate moderate voters, especially in the state, when you break it down by party registration, there are more undeclared or independent voters in this state than there are Democrats or Republicans individually by those parties. So what that means is it's more fertile ground for Nikki Haley, and you're seeing that in the polling that we've been seeing uh, leading into, uh, or I should say over the past week or so. But I'll tell you, talking to campaigns, talking to voters, talking to allies of these candidates, the the thing that they admit, folks here in New Hampshire, they admit, it's sometimes a little bit hard for them to admit this, but they admit that they've been watching Iowa and the results in Iowa matter. If you look at DeSantis, if you look at Nikki Haley, 
both of those campaigns were looking for what they could describe as an overperformance to lead mm -hmm. them with some momentum as they get into New Hampshire. It's not clear that either of them got that. You'll hear the campaigns argue that they have some momentum coming in, but there was no clear dominant second place performance for either of those two candidates. So the consistency that you saw in Iowa where the polling kind of matched the results, the fear for some of the people here in New Hampshire is that that dominance that Trump has in the polls right now is something that you'll see extend to next week. Is there anything we're waiting for? I mean, Nikki Haley has Governor Sununu's endorsement. Are there any other big endorsements hanging out there or any other big moments that could happen between now and Tuesday? I think, you know, throughout this entire campaign, yes, there are endorsements that are there. There are endorsements not only by political leaders, but also some of those groups. Those still exist, and, you know, she does have the governor's endorsement here. But I think the biggest moment you can look for is what we've seen throughout this campaign, and it's the debate stage. We know that there's a debate scheduled on the books for Thursday. That's the WMUR debate, a traditional debate here in uh, New Hampshire. Nikki Haley has not uh, agreed to go to that debate as a of yet that's still up in the air. Ron DeSantis has poked some fun at her for not making that agreement yet. And then there's another debate later this week or uh, later this weekend. That's one where both candidates have agreed to show up and appear at. So if there is any moment that could shift the dynamics there, that would be it. And you know, the one thing that a uh, caution when you look at the polls that I was just even uh, referring to, um, those polls include a name. Chris Christie. And he was polling at about 12 percent consistently in a lot of the polls that we saw last week before he suspended his campaign. We don't know where the majority of his support mm -hmm. will go, but I'll tell you, I was at his campaign uh, announcement where he suspended and I talked to the folks in the room, his core supporters. Many of them that night said, oh, I don't know who, I'll, who I can support. I feel lost now, one supporter told me. I've been checking in with them over the past couple of days or so, and the majority of those who I interacted with that day are now supporting Nikki Haley. So that could be a boost for mm. her. But again, when you look at the Iowa results, she did not get that second place finish that some people were hoping for, especially allies of her campaign. The question of momentum and if it can fundamentally, fundamentally shift the dynamics here in New Hampshire to now beat Donald Trump, that's still an open question and it looks to be an uphill battle, at least at this point. That would certainly be good news for Nikki Haley. Shaq Brewster, I know it's not that as cold there as it is in Iowa, but it still looks really cold. You've been on the ground with voters throughout this campaign cycle. Thank you so much for staying up late with us tonight, for bringing us some insights from the ground in New Hampshire. I'm back here with my panel. So we were just kind of mapping this out in the sort of fantasy football version of politics, I guess, which is like, if you were on, on, uh, on Haley's campaign or advice, her what would her first what would the next week look like I know part of the answer from you David Pluff is that she would have had a rally before tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow afternoon well, she better. it may seem like a small thing but it's not tactically you know she should do an event when she lands even if it's 4 a.m. so that everyone who looks at their phone watches the morning shows has talk radio has footage and sound of Haley saying New Hampshire you know, you can basically turn the page on Trump and Biden and uh, like it's malpractice not to do that, even though you're tired. But I think the rest of the week, I mean, uh, there'll be a lot of advertising, most of social, a lot on MUR. Like, I think they should have actual New Hampshire voters who voted for Trump say, I'm not doing it anymore. And why? That would be a good thing mm -hmm. to do. I think doing a lot of OTRs. We know she's a good speaker. Which so is when you show up unannounced. Yeah, I can't believe I used that term, OTR, <laughs> off the record, meaning you go to coffee shops and diners and, and bars. I think the debates are, t are tough. because Whether I'm not she sure, should go or not. Because I do think MUR is the major station in New Hampshire. So there could be some downside of, like, stiffing them, mm -hmm. looking like you're afraid. On the other hand, DeSantis is irrelevant in New Hampshire. It's probably all downside for Haley. Mm -hmm. So that's a tough one, and they probably got to make that decision. You know, they're probably making it now on the plane. Um, but I think she needs to have a frantic pace. She started to be a little more uh, strong in her indictment of Trump tonight, but she needs to do a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. I think have other people making that. 
uh, and be prepared for Trump's barbs because, again, he's not going to be gentle this week. No. Um, <laughs> he, he's even predicted he's not going to be gentle. Yeah. He's told us he's, he's not going to be gentle. Us. And then I don't know organizationally, it's less important in a primary than a caucus, but clearly DeSantis... And let's, he came in second place. It's 2,000 votes in Iowa. Like, if I'm her, I'm, if she gets asked, why do you say it's a two-person race? Say, listen, I'm the only one with a legitimate chance to be Trump here in New Hampshire. Well, DeSantis beat you. Well, he put all his chips there. It was 2,000 votes. Like, just don't worry about that. But, you know, I think, you know, you look at Steve Kornacki did a good job in Des Moines, Polk County, Dallas County, suburban counties. She should have done better. Now, the question is, was the register poll off, or did she not fully materialize all support? My guess is DeSantis, as bad a candidate as he's been, his organization helped him get to 21% mm -hmm. of the vote. So Haley's got to make sure, particularly those Democrats and independents, actually come out. Yeah. It, yeah. Ann Seltzer, she, now, she, not to give her too much credit, but she did say in the interviews that Haley may have some problems, right? Because as we all know, a poll is like test of a moment in time, and then there's sort of the momentum question. I did want to play something she said tonight, because she continues to make this electability argument. And I think the question I have is, should she keep making it? But let's play it. We can talk about it. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to earn the support of a majority of Americans. All the evidence says that if it's a Trump-Biden rematch, it's going to be another toss-up election. It could go either way. We could have more disputes over election interference. And Joe Biden could win again. Nope. With Kamala Harris waiting in the wings. Lord help us if that happens. There, there's a lot to unpack there as we're all talking about how Nikki Haley is sort of like the, the moderate version. She just said disputes over election interference is that that's not on the level, just to be clear. Um, and she it's also called an insurrection. It's called okay. an insurrection. I, yeah. Let's call it what it is. And then the Kamala Harris thing is such a I don't know if it's a it's not a dog whistle. It's more than a dog whistle. It's like Joe Biden's old. He may die. That's what she's That's saying. Yeah. And Kamala Harris is a black woman. That is what she is saying from that podium there. That aside, this electability argument, which, which really didn't pop up in these entry polls, right? But it is sort of the theme of what she's been saying. She's next generation. Let's turn the page from the past leadership. Is that the best core argument? or what? what no, she... it's not. It's not. Uh, look, the... the... <sighs> The Democratic and Republican primaries have proven to us not once, but now twice, that they want two old white men. <laughs> okay? Uh, can we, can we, again, let's get past the point that's in front of us. The reality of it is, in 2020, you had on, the, on those stages, you had the next generation running against Donald Trump mm -hmm. and Joe Biden. Right. OK, so on the Republican side, they were like, oh, y'all stand down. We ain't doing this. Right. So they shut it down. So it all focused on the Democrats. The Democrats had a swath of folks that they could have put out there over Joe Biden and they didn't. So why are you complaining now about the guy you picked four years ago? Mm -hmm. Right. Same narrative here for Republicans in this race. You're sitting here and, and if it's not age, it's electability. All right. You know who you've got sitting over in the wings waiting to go on the stage to take the crown, right? And yet, what are the numbers showing us? 51% in Iowa. So all of this stuff about age and electability is nonsense because the voters are telling you who they want. So let's gear up. Giddy up and get into the campaign around those two candidates. Gear up, okay. giddy up. Okay, that's maybe that's part of her speech. I'm not sure. Or, or that won't be her speech. Everyone. Uh, it's still going to be the electability it's thing. It's going to be. Okay, Tim, let's just say because there's still a primary coming up in New Hampshire. Yeah. You've worked for. Some losers of New Hampshire, so People I can tell you what to do. That was not what I was going to say, but I was going to say a number of Republican candidates. What argument should Nikki Haley be making? 
Okay, well, in our little fantasy that we're playing here, do, do, I, do, do I get it. a time machine? Do I get to go you back can. to the past? You can do a time <laughs> because, machine. Yeah, there I are mean, no rules. Okay, because then I would have started seven months ago trying to prosecute some kind of case yeah. for why Donald Trump shouldn't be the nominee. Except and, and Chris Christie did okay, that, and then people don't, don't, don't like him. You don't go full Chris Christie. Okay. There was a path that was, was between path. the Chris yeah, Christie great. path and between yeah. the, oh, I think the deep state's coming after Mr. Trump path. Um, and I don't have any substantive criticisms of him except for chaos seems to follow him like a bad smell. Like, I don't, like, I, you, there, there was something in between that and Chris Christie. And we're here now, and, and so you can't start up a new criticism against him now, because then it sounds like sour grapes. Mm. So all she has left is the electability argument. But the problem is, she's made the electability argument. She's backed herself into a corner. And guess what? The Republican voters, they think Donald Trump won in 2020. Yeah. That's they also, also think the he's more electable yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, some of them think he's still the president, okay? <laughs> and he controls the military. So you can't make a case about electability against people who think that Donald Trump has won twice. So I, I, that's the problem. She's backed herself into this corner. I, I think that it might be the best card she has to, to use Plum's analogy in a, in a poor deck. But like what, what either her or DeSantis really need to do was go backwards six months, use the millions upon millions that donors gave them, and actually prosecute a case against Donald Trump instead of against each other. I, I mean, and DeSantis, who, who really, uh, he's very late to the game here, but seems to, over the last couple of weeks, almost been sort of attacking Trump a little bit. I mean, he said yeah, over right. the weekend that, that if Trump was the nominee, Biden would be leave, leading in swing states. No one cares because no one That's thinks right. that he is. DeSantis is making some good points. It's like kind that. of interesting. <laughs> uh, we have to sneak in a very very quick break. Coming up, Donald Trump is on his way to New York, where he will attend the start of another trial. This one about how much he will have to pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. George Conway joins the conversation when we come back. We're back after a quick break. In just a few hours, Donald Trump is expected to attend a trial that will decide how much, Trump, how much he has to pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. Trump has said he does plan to attend and testify as well at this trial. And remember, he's already been found liable for defaming and sexually assaulting her. But after the first trial, he just wouldn't stop attacking her. He couldn't stop himself. He recently posted about her 40 times in a single day on Truth Social. That's totally a stable thing to do. He did attempt to have the trial delayed, saying he couldn't attend on Wednesday because it's the same day as the funeral for Melania Trump's mother. That request was denied after Carol's lawyers called him out for having a campaign event scheduled in New Hampshire on the same day. It's very awkward. Joining our conversation is conservative attorney George Conway, who I'm assuming has some thoughts about all of this uh, because he's been admitted into evidence in this case. So let me first say, though, thank you for staying up with us. Um, this is like your real commitment to democracy here, being up with us at 1.30 in the morning. We really, really appreciate it. But, but let me start with that because you, George, you, you tell us what it means to be admitted into evidence as, as you sort of announced on Twitter. Today. What do you, what are your, and tell us a little bit more also about what your predictions are for how this will all play out. All right. Well, the, the story about my being admitted into evidence was the fact that I introduced, actually, Jean Carroll walked up to me at a party in 2019 and asked me what she, whether she thought um, she had a case. And I said, yes, I think you do. And I know the right lawyer for you. And it turned out she did hire that lawyer and bring the case. And for some reason, Trump's lawyers at the first trial were absolutely obsessed with this fact, and they kept trying to bring it up, much to the annoyance of the judge. But uh, Gene's lawyers decided, well, we don't mind the fact that it, that a former Republican pointed us to the pointed my, my our client to the law, to the lawyer who she hired, and so they they had, they let they put it in the evidence themselves, and then Trump kept banging on it and trying to make something out of it the judge wouldn't have at it. But in the uh, pre-trial evidentiary rulings last week for this week's trial, the judge said, you can't talk about how Gene Carroll got her lawyer, except you can talk about Conway if you really want to. <laughs> so I mean, here I am, admitted into evidence twice, two, two out of two trials. There you so. are. Congratulations <laughs> on that note. So what are we expecting tomorrow? What are you watching for tomorrow? Or this week? Well, I, you know, I mean, I, obviously he is going to try to make this a circus, but the fact of the matter is it's going to be very, very hard for him to do that because you've got a, a federal judge who is about 500,000 times smarter than he is and much, much and, and very, very strict in what he allows uh, to happen in his courtroom. And another thing that's happening is that because he lost the first trial, 
he basically doesn't get to contest any of the key things that were at issue in the first trial, which is the fact that he raped Jean Carroll and the fact that what he said about Jean Carroll was defamatory. This trial is only going to be about damages because uh, we can, you can only you know, fight an issue with the party once and then you're bound by that result. The only reason why there are two trials was the first trial related to things that he said after he became president and the original sexual assault. Um, which wasn't part of the original lawsuit. The original lawsuit, which is the one that's going to trial this week, was the lawsuit for the false things that he said in when he was president, when he denied the, the, the allegation that the jury has found to be accurate, that, he, that she was raped by Donald Trump, and also you know, he, the, that, that she had made a false statement. Those were libelous, the don mm -hmm. denial of the, of, of the incident and, and the calling of her a liar. So um, the fact that he was president uh, I should point out, means that whatever damages for this defamation occurred well, should be greater than the, defam than the damages from the defamation in the prior case. It's really not remarkable because nothing's surprising that he like right. couldn't stop himself from attacking her. He posted forty right. times he on Truth can. Social. He yeah. he still may he still he's he's planning to attend the trial and speak. Right. Now now while I have you, I did want to ask you. Of course, there was the Iowa caucus tonight, which I'm sure you were fully tracking, and there were some entry polls uh, in that. In one of those entry polls, sixty five percent of caucus goers said if Trump were to be convicted of a crime, they would consider him fit to be president. Do you think that's reflective of the electorate? Is that people aren't paying attention? Is it that they don't know the details? What's what's going on there? Help well, us I understand. Mean, I, I think it's re a reflector, it reflects the, the, the Republican electorate in Iowa. I absolutely believe that. I think it reflects a significant part of the uh, uh, Republican electorate because what has happened with these people is they've decided to forsake facts. They've decided to forsake evidence. They've decided to forsake reality in favor of trying to bolster in their own minds this fantasy view of Donald Trump, that he's somehow a decent person, somehow an intelligent person, somehow a competent person, somehow a moral person, and somehow a law-abiding law person, none of which is true. But the problem for them is that the evidence is all against them. So what they do is they continue to turn it out, and they say, oh, it's a big conspiracy against him. They don't listen to the evidence, and none, nothing that will happen in these legal proceedings will affect mm -hmm. how those people vote. Uh, it will, however, I believe, affect the way... Um, Americans who are sensible, who listen to facts, and who might go either way, depending on uh, normal considerations. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that those people are going to basically say, we cannot have this. I think that we're seeing that in the polls, too, is an important point for people to remember about the totality of the electorate. George Conway, thank you for staying up with thank us you. tonight. I owe you, we all owe you one, and for helping us understand what to expect right. uh, tomorrow. So, Thank you. Jennifer Palmieri, let me turn to you, because I just, I think it's like, it really still <laughs> bends my brain here. I mean, he sexually assaulted this woman. He continues to attack her. I mean, as of recently, he posted 40 posts on True Social, which is a crazy person thing to do. Why does nobody seem to really care about I'm this, or do they? The front runner of the Republican Party, the guy that just won Iowa by more than 50 points, that the, that the next thing he's going to do is going to go testify at the sexual assault at the next iteration and probably attack her at the sexual assault trial at which he's already been found as factually as having as having committed this assault like this could go off the rails this might not be great you know this might be something that helps nikki haley next week i mean how he's going to attack her people don't like i mean it's one thing to think that these you know doj cases are you know pursued by the biden campaign or you know by the biden administration for people to be under that um, uh, misconception, but to go and attack this woman on this, putting him on the stand on this, this is this is not a sound decision. It this could go. This could not go well. It could definitely not go well. There's a lot of people who are not in the Republican electorate who will vote. Um, everyone, stay put. Coming up, a trip down memory lane, especially for David Plouffe and some thoughts about this night in Iowa back in 2008 and how different our politics are now. We'll be right back.
By now, we all know that Donald Trump's vision for America, if you even want to really call it that, isn't exactly about lifting this country up. It's about retribution. His words, those are his words. And that theme was very clear in his speech tonight, which cast the 2024 race in dark and divisive terms, even if he was a little low energy, I would say. But needless to say, Trump's rhetoric stood in stark contrast with the kind of unifying language we heard from the winner of the Iowa caucus back in 2008, the guy who Pluff, Palmieri, and I all used to work for. Just take a look at the comparison between Obama then and Trump now. You came together as Democrats, Republicans, and independents to stand up and say that we are one nation. We were a great nation three years ago, and now we're a nation in decline. We are not a collection of red states and blue states. We are the United States of America. Our country is laughed at. All over the world, they're laughing at us. You'll be able to look back with pride and say that this was the moment when it all began. If the fake news would become real and honest news, 90% of our problems in this country would be solved. Something better awaits us if we have the courage to reach for it and to work for it and to fight for it. We're going to have to deport. We're going to have to have a deportation level that we haven't seen in this country for a long time. Hope is the bedrock of this nation. I go to a lot of courthouses because of Biden, because they're using that for election interference. This was the moment when we finally beat back the politics of fear and doubt and cynicism. He is the worst president that we've had in the history of our country. He's destroying our country. The panel is back with me. I did not mean to end our time together on sort of a dark, uplifting, I'm not sure, <laughs> note. But I think one of the questions here is sort of, can our politics come back? Um, I mean, remember that election cycle, Barack Obama, who looks like a baby there, by the he way. He looks like Barack Obama's son. <laughs> he looks like his son. <laughs> but our campaign was running against John McCain, right? A war hero who was overall a good guy. Can it come back? Huh, I mean, sometime. Uh, but I think Donald Trump has contaminated the water table of our politics and obviously of the Republican Party. You can't, you, that doesn't just fix. You know, mm -hmm. like the, the, when there's an oil spill in a lake, it's not like you can just fix it in, in a year and it just turns. It just turns. Uh, I think that the speech he gave was really dark. He didn't even include, he invited the brick suit man on stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the guy, like, this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. Like, the Republicans are about to nominate by acclamation somebody who is who did an American carnage speech and then attempted a coup and, and he's inviting somebody on stage who's a gadfly who just wants to build a wall to, so that we can, you know, make sure that people are not welcome in this country anymore, the shining city on the hill party. I mean, it's a dark thing. And so it's like, no, I, I, don't, I don't think that we're just going to flip a switch. Joe Biden wins and we all go back to hopey, changey stuff. And in 2028, Michael Steele is the nominee of this party. Oh, I don't, watch I out. Not, You've I got some that's fundraising happened. and rebuilding the Republican Party. I'm, I'm calling this brother right here. <laughs> that's right. That's how we're going to do he's it. He's retired. Did you hear? No, he uh, David Bluff, <laughs> what, watching that, I mean, that probably brought you back. What did you think watching that? Well, first of all, I mean, Trump's had some bad makeup days. Tonight might have been the worst. Oof. That was really scary. <laughs> um, here's what I'd say. I agree with Tim, but I, I still think there's maybe 50 to 50 percent, 5 percent of the country that longs for more unity, that longs for a bigger purpose, that would like us to, you know, that may sound hopelessly naive. And so... I think Obama spoke to that then. I still think that audience is out there, mm -hmm. uh, but it's smaller than it was. Um, but to me, that you know, Barack Obama has said that that was even more than winning the presidency twice. Um, that was his most special political night, mm -hmm. and it was because we were a huge underdog, and put together something largely uh, driven by a bunch of 21 to 25 year old kids organizing. And first time Cox attenders, 17 year olds, 70 years olds, mm -hmm. Republicans, independents. And by the way, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we're able to win that primary against such a strong front runner and, and win the presidency. And that kind of coalition. 50,000 people turned out to caucus. Yeah, a huge, a huge, right. And, and I think, and, and people like, you know, John Edwards, Hillary Clinton, people love their candidates. I mean, I, I think it was, it was great to see. It was not the slog we saw tonight. Um, but I still have to believe there's a majority in this country that's hungry for the volume to be lowered down and, and us to find areas of agreement. Um, but I agree, it's been contaminated. 
Uh, and, and, and we just got to make it through this election, which is a very big if, to have a chance to rebuild back to have moments like that again. Jack, can I add something in here? Please, go ahead. I feel like um, I'm not sure that people are going to be ready for, to be able to, you know, cast their ballots based on great, if, if inspiring rhetor leadership rhetoric like we hear, heard from President Obama. I think they just, you know, people are, are, are exhausted, jaded, you know, don't, not sure what to believe, and they need results, right? They need government to deliver and be, to solve problems. And I, I think, and not to ask so much of us to believe in after, like, of everything that we've seen, but to show, you know, government can do this. It can solve problems. It can take things on and, like, build back credibility a bit by bit. And then we can get to the point where people are willing to see this can still work, this can still hang together. Facts matter. You know, if you're if you're fixing roads and building bridges, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are more likely to believe your truth that you're speaking the truth uh, than uh, than what Trump says. But it's like a lot of credibility is going to have to be won back before you can get to this inspiring level. You got about 15 seconds, but you're a professional. Give us a little hope here. The hope lies in between Tim and David, in in the sense that Tim is is marking the moment right now. David is clarifying the opportunity. And the question to the rest of us, U.S., is which, which America do you want? Because the, it, whatever it is, you're going to create it beginning in November. Because what comes in January is going to set the course for the country for quite some time. So you've got to find that hope and optimism in yourself in order to translate it out to your neighbor and your friends, because otherwise it's going to be a long slog and the world's going to look more like what Tim has described than what David has des described. And with that, I say good day. It's going to be a long slog. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, had to we had to end on a little bit of a hopey, changey yeah. thing. Uh, not until the three of us worked for Obama at one time. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, yeah. we can. Yes, we can return to democracy, everyone. David Clough, Michael Steele, Tim Miller, Jennifer Palmieri, thank you for staying up late with me, for breaking down all of these results with me and what it means. That does it for us this hour. But stay right where you are, because more special coverage of the Iowa caucus is coming up after a quick break.